uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be associated with uh, today's activity and i'm uh, very happy to uh, will dr kato be speaking first yes yes so i'm very happy to introduce her i think yogo kato does not need any introduction uh, to the world of neurosurgery and uh, uh, i think all of us uh, have learned quite a lot of uh, vascular neurosurgery from her and her passion for teaching is enormous and i would request her to start the proceedings for the day uh, dr dr atul can i can i connect sir yes yes can we go live yes okay sir you are live good to go sir here okay yoko yes yes the box right now okay thank you very much so so it is a great pleasure to uh, attend the party royal and also the abida shah uh, uh, the nice uh, web conference uh, which is uh, uh, focus on the the skull base and the 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 vascular the neurosurgery i'm so happy to see uh, to see all of your face you looks very great because i had so many bad news of the india of course that we have so many bad news of the, the japan about uh, uh, covid 19s but i'm so so happy to see you that you looks very great thank you so much for kind invitation and the, today just uh, maybe I, i talked many times of this uh, the uh, topics uh, just uh, i i really want to know the uh, some uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, property that is the another very important things uh, to predict of the aneurysm which is going to the the eruption in the future or not so today i'm going to uh, So this is already I showed many times. Uh, this is a giant aneurysm of the, the near brain stem, and uh, this patient is treated by the many times in another hospital. Uh, the stent coil, and after that stent stent coil. So, but the, uh, the finally, is uh, even the, uh, so many the treatments. So patient, uh, the aneurysm is uh, growing and growing. And finally, uh, the patient came to us. And this is uh, uh, the aneurysm mole, uh, which is uh, very sick. And it is uh, so many uh, the big uh, muscle bazarum on the wall. So uh, I think uh, this type of the aneurysm, partially slumbus aneurysm is uh, Uh, totally different from the usual uh, sacral type of the aneurysm. So this is uh, the nutrition come from the aneurysm wall itself. So we should be very careful to treat of the, those uh, another one, another type of the aneurysm. So why aneurysm size increase even after stenting the calling with a uh, abscess flow? Uh, on uh, analyzing the histopathology report, mm -hmm. the uh, aneurysm sac, and uh, we found uh, several things. So this is a uh, uh, Pathology of the vasobasum. So this is magnification, and uh, this is arrow of the vasobasum. And uh, so this type of the giant and so called, we do not want to the, uh, call uh, just uh, uh, giant aneurysm, but uh, it should be called intramural wall disease. So vasobasum play role of the aneurysm uh, uh, growth. So this means it's a proliferative disease of the vessel wall. So this is how illustrative. This is just a small the the, the, the aneurysm case, but we uh, send it to the pathology. So this is a very simple part. This is a very sick part. So the uh, this seam wall is a mural ge generation with the uh, with, with seam wall, and the sick uh, part of the wall is uh, atherogenic. The changes. So this is the CFD, so this is the part, it's a very thin part, is uh, very high pressure and also the vector is a diverging. So the, this part is uh, so-called very thin, the place of the anise wall. 
And on the other hand is uh, this part is uh, uh, conversion of the, the vector and also that this is OSI is a very hot spot. So this means is uh, the usually the very uh, scrotic type of the wall. And uh, so this very special, the stain uh, we did. So we uh, understood that part, the yellow part is very uh, uh, inflammation in the wall and the very degeneration. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next case, uh, which we cut it and send it to the, the pathology. Uh, so, and this part is uh, the just uh, the the vector is just for uh, the um, pa parallel the type of the uh, pattern, and uh, also the histopathology that tell us uh, some degeneration and the. Uh, into the migration of the myo, uh, myofibroblast. And also, this is a foundation of the stain that shows us the fiber uh, thickening of the intima. So, internal elastic lamina is a degeneration. So, another the stain, that this is smooth muscle fiber, is uh, uh, some uh, de de degeneration. So, this is uh, again the same. So, these histopathological findings suggest that the same. Uh, this part of the anus wall was completely stabilization due to remodeling. That means it uh, comes very thick. And the case three is a large, uh, no, the medium size of the MCA. So this is a 3D CT. So in this part is uh, uh, the vector change is uh, uh, kind of the, the, uh, the thick part. And also OSI is a rather hot. Uh, Sorry. So this is a video, and this is a usual ICG. So this is, this is uh, the dissection of the, the cilium fissure, and this is a uh, for 800. And this is just we reconstruct of the M1 MCA and small. Uh, several clip we applied, and the we uh, reconstruction of the MCA. So this is endoscopic view. So we can see the contralateral side of the, uh, the MCA in wall. So the two things we, uh, the well, uh, 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 reconstruction of the M1. And this is another, the giant. So this is uh, still we are uh, uh, treating uh, for this, the aneurysm. So the, this aneurysm is uh, 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 the recirculation flow with uh, the area of the uh, stagnation in some part. So the, that stagnation part is here. So this is uh, the diversion of the, the dome and the aneurysm sac. So this is uh, also converging. So this part is uh, also the very uh, high uh, OSI. So this may be uh, uh, the very sick part of the aneurysm. So just we can predict the, the, this type of the large giant of the aneurysm, the how soon of the aneurysm will be ruptured or not. So, so this is a, a before treatment of the, the aneurysm. This is a virtual trunk and this is a, a V union. And uh, of course, we uh, at the beginning we uh, uh, consulted of the endovascular team, but they refused because of the so so critical change of the main trunk for uh, the digitization. So this is a pre sigmoid approach. So this is the the small. So some part is uh, the same, some part is quite the same. So finally, uh, this is the fifth nerve and. Uh, so this is a uh, proximal uh, the vaginal trunk is quite a uh, static change, but anus wall is uh, comparing with uh, the proximal the trunk uh, is quite a thin. This part is very thin. This another part is uh, quite a thin. So we try to best for uh, the clipping. So this is uh, uh, okay. I'm so sorry. 
So we try to the, put the clip with the, the three, uh, but we could not put the, the uh, proximal contour because it's very thick, uh, the aesthetic change. Anyway, finally, uh, so this is the endosco endoscopic view. Is It looks like nice, nicely uh, uh, clipped. But unfortunately, uh, so but uh, unfortunately, so this is uh, the result of the, the first clipping uh, procedure. So still some big part of the aneurysm is uh, uh, remaining. And uh, so then uh, the second step, we try to once again uh, the endovascular treatment, but still uh, because of the the aneurysm, the bulging is uh, divided the two parts. So this green part and the other part. So this green part is embolized by foil. But we could not uh, the ins insert of the, the cat catheter to the, the large portion of the aneurysm. So still uh, we cannot, uh, we still ongoing of the treatment of this uh, the large part of the yeah, and maybe we will once again try on the uh, coiling or the uh, direct picking. So this is the model of the growth of the aneurysm is uh, some heat of the, the, uh, the uh, flow and this became very thin. And uh, this is a uh, so development of the recirculation flow here and uh, uh, they become the thickness of the wall, and next to uh, the, the thickness of the wall, they become thin. So this is a uh, uh, development of multi, uh, multiple area of the high OSI and the, lo the local uh, recirculation flow. This is a remodeling of the wall and the aneurysm growth. So this is a one by one. It's become the large or larger and larger. So this is a development of the velocity, the, the gradient, the formation of the aneurysm, the uh, several steps. So recitation is very uh, key, uh, important things. So it becomes of the strongest progress uh, in preliminary and aneurysm growth. And also the, the wall chest stress is another key factor. So streamline and the uh, wall chest stress and also the vector, the three components are very important. So those uh, mechanisms become the aneurysm that grows we uh, suspected. So this is uh, just a uh, uh, hit of the, uh, the wall. And uh, at the beginning, this part has become very thin. So the, and it's kind of the stabilization after the warm while. And the next part become the thin. So that is then uh, the aneurysm become the growing. So this is a CFD, this is uh, the wall pressure, and this is wall chest stress, and also the vector. This is a three component is very, very important. And the diversion and conversion of the vector is another important thing. So this is uh, the wall pressure, and this is a, uh, this is a CS stress, and this is a vector. So this is a very uh, uh, easy to understand of the, uh, our theory. So this is a, a diversion of the, the streamline, and also this is a vector, uh, also the diversion. And this part is very thin. And this is a uh, uh, high pressure and uh, uh, the low wall chest stress. So this is again the same things. And also the predict uh, a prediction of the aneurysm rupture and the future, the, the wall property is very important. So the, this is a, a wall enhancement of the, when we uh, give uh, the, the contrast uh, media, uh, medium. Uh, 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 yes. So this is a, the uh, It has a two aneurysm. This is a peripheral aneurysm. It's a bell okay. uh, enhancement. So that means it's, uh, so this aneurysm should be the uh, rupture one. So the, uh, to discriminate of the, between the stable and unstable aneurysm uh, with uh, uh, wall enhancement uh, procedure. And also the, the larger type of the aneurysm and also the location of the ACA and PCOM uh, is more uh, frequent, uh, easy to be enhanced. 
So this is the, the, the when we suggest yeah, some uh, the check of the ball properties, yeah. one is a CFD, the another one is uh, inflammation, <laughs> such as uh, the macrophage, etc. And also uh, some other uh, endothelial uh, macrophage in, infiltration. And this is a good mi microbiota. So this is another uh, important factor to become, become one of the weak, weakness of the anus wall. So this is uh, uh, another thing is uh, Professor Nozaki uh, the mentioned about the study, right now. Of the drug of the study. So imaging predictors of the rupture is uh, so many uh, people is uh, uh, already uh, just, just, uh, I'll wait for published a paper. Right. Is one is a basal basal formation and the inflammation. Uh, that we can suspect with uh, uh, contrast enhancement of the uh, MRI. So the uh, assessment of the Anderson wall, uh, like CFD and uh, the wall enhancement is uh, current. Uh, maybe the prediction of the aneurysm, uh, the sickness of the wall. So uh, preemptive, the medicine can be established with uh, specific uh, biomarkers and the imaging. Uh, modalities to prevent of the delayed, the onset of the symptoms of several aneurysm. So finally, just uh, I'd like to mention about uh, my teacher, is Professor Kano. Uh, he is uh, still uh, quite a quite a, a fit. Uh, he is writing uh, the, the books every day, but three times a week he uh, goes to the outpatient clinic and the see the patient. And another, my teacher is Dr. Sano, but he taught me the, the lots of the skill of the, the aneurysm. And uh, the finally, so the, this is alumni member uh, of the Fujita Health University. Uh, so many Indian sky came to our department. I'm so happy to, to work with them. The welcome uh, to uh, my department once uh, everything is uh, the finish. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yoko, for the <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> wonderful lecture on a very difficult subject. Thank you so difficult. much. Yeah. And uh, as uh, Dr. Dev Pujari was saying, you have taught the whole world vascular surgery. Professor Kano and San, Professor Sano and Yoko Kato have taught the whole of the world how to do complex neurosurgery how to do vascular neurosurgery. And of course, uh, it is my great pleasure to see you on my screen. Thank you very much, Yoko, thank for you. joining. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you. I will ask Siddharth. Siddharth, can you, uh, do you have some questions for uh, Siddharth? Are you there? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Good evening, Professor Gato. Yeah, it was a Hi, how are you? Sorry, yeah. I, uh, thank you. Sorry, thank I, you so much. my, my Zoom was, uh, took a little time, so I was five minutes late. Sorry for that. So it was a uh, it's very uh, important uh, talk for us to know actually the pathogenesis of the aneurysm growth. So <clears throat> as you said that it's all depends upon the OSI and also the increased shearing force. So that was a good thing and especially the formation of the fibroblasts that you saw showed in the in the uh, path pathology slides. That's really good information for us. So I would ask anybody who wants to ask any questions to Professor Carter. Well, I would like to ask a question myself, uh, Yoko. <laughs> uh, I mean, you are giving us newer insights into the pathogenesis of uh, uh, aneurysms uh, per se, and uh, especially the giant aneurysms. And uh, we see incredible surgery from you and Professor Sano to clip this uh, giant aneurysms. Uh, what is your uh, strategy? I mean, do you plan to sort of clip every giant aneurysm or do you think of alternative measures like bypass and exclusion of uh, these aneurysms? Where, where do you draw the line as to when will you go for a direct surgery? So the, uh, the, with uh, some uh, research of the CFD or preoperative, that we uh, check all the parameters. So if the anesthesia is the wall is uh, the quite the, uh, how, how do I say, not so thick or the not so the, the strongest. 
the start of the uh, reconstruction. Then maybe uh, go to the, the direct. But sometimes uh, some... Uh, because it really uh, remains. So I think you have to strategically plan it properly. That's the yes. most important lesson, I think, yeah. uh, we all learn. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh, what we'll do is we'll go to Hongo now and we will keep some questions as they come to Dr. Kato. As they come, we can ask them later. So before, uh, I will request Dr. Hongo to please share your screen. Professor Hongo is going to talk to us about uh, brainstem cavernous malformations from the Shinsu University. Of course, everybody knows uh, Hongo. <clears throat> he was, uh, he is in Shinsu University, now a boss of Shinsu University. And uh, you will hear what he has to say on cavernous malformations, cavernous cavernomas of the brainstem. And I'm sure we will all learn from him. He's the great master of vascular surgery, Dr. Hongo. Hongo? Uh, you need to unmute yourself, Professor un Hongo. Un unmute yourself, for Hongo. Hello? Yeah. Yes. Oh, thank you for the kind invitation, Atu and uh, others. After Professor Kato's lecture, I yeah, I will talk on my <clears throat> topic today. I'm afraid uh, my video is uh, working or not, but anyway, I'll start my presentation. Uh, this is the hospital I'm work currently working after uh, uh, moving from uh, the Shinsu University. It's a uh, nice city and my topic uh, today is surgery for the brainstem cavernous malformation this is my favorite topic and what is the su suitable approach uh, I'll talk on this nothing to disclose well uh, here is a very famous human wing neurosurgical surgery it takes four volumes one of it uh, includes a section vascular section I've uh, one of the editor of vascular section. And in that uh, section, there is the uh, description of brainstem cavernous malformation of uh, the surgical indication. Uh, the patient has repeated hemorrhage with a progressive neurological deficit, then removal. I think uh, <clears throat> the brainstem cavernous malformation is a good indication for surgery when uh, hemorrhage repeated and the patient has the neurological deficit. Well, uh, another <clears throat> next point uh, issue to uh, consider is selecting a suitable surgical approach. Well, <clears throat> uh, first to enter the brainstem from less elegant area and the sh from the shallowest point and to reach the brainstem with minimal minimal or no damage to the brain parenchyma. I think it's very important. So uh, that is the, uh, we need to enter from so-called safe entry zone. <clears throat> well, here is the very famous and I think important uh, paper from Professor Spetzer on Journal of Neurosurgery to, uh, 2016. Uh, they describe very nicely <clears throat> the various uh, safe entry zones uh, from the midbrain, pons, and medulla. I'd like to show just uh, briefly here. As midbrain, the, they said lateral mesencephalic sulcus, intercurricular region, and anterior mesencephalic zone. These are these safe entry zone. And how about pons? Uh, there is supracurricular zone, infracurricular zone, median sulcus from the behind, and from lateral or anterior, and the supratrigeminal zone, peritrigeminal zone, and lateral trigeminal zone. And regarding the middle of longata from behind, uh, yeah, uh, various also uh, various entry zones, anterolateral sulcus, lateral med 
Medrulizon, Olivrizon, Postelium median sulcus. All these uh, up <coughs> safety zones we uh, uh, kept in mind. Then, how about approaching to that entry point? Uh, we need to have uh, various approaches using skull base or some others. Uh, from uh, there are various uh, surgical approaches to enter the brain stem, reach the brain stem uh, to get the uh, entry zone, interhemispheric, transcervian, and so forth. These are various approaches we can uh, select according to the site of entry point. <laughs> and now uh, I'd like to show a couple of cases. Uh, <clears throat> The point is uh, select the suitable approach to have the uh, to enter to reach the brainstem with minimum or no damage to the normal uh, tissue. So here is the boy, 14 year boy, came to us with right hand paralysis. The division is here uh, from midbrain to thalamus. And how is uh, do we need to select without damaging the normal structure? and still uh, remove all the uh, lesion safely. The patient has just the right hemiparesis and some uh, visual field uh, loss. And I selected this approach, palamidians plus cerebellar transdentural approach uh, to minimize the normal tissue. And then uh, with the patient placed in the prone and uh, I approached uh, with this incision and video is uh, visible. Can you see my video? Hello? No, we can't see. Uh, you can see, well, I can't be fixed yet. Uh, <clears throat> with, uh, Anyway, yeah, uh, with uh, this approach, uh, the, yeah, here showing the post op MRI, uh, or, yeah, uh, going through the tentorium. Now, uh, the uh, deep uh, basal vein is and mid, mid, medium. Temple lobe is reflected laterally, and now we go here and uh, put the small incision and remove the whole lesion with about five, six millimeters uh, uh, entry gently under high magnification. And <clears throat> uh, here showing the post op MRI, uh, here's the axis. And the patient uh, had some. Uh, here is showing the post of patient condition, but uh, I'm afraid uh, you cannot see the patient can walk ambulant. And uh, mild right, uh, right hand paralysis, but he can walk and still having some visual field deficit because of uh, yeah, uh, lateral genocrate body. Uh, a little bit damaged uh, even before the uh, surgery. And <clears throat> well, uh, then this is the case of Pontine lesion, rather big one, 21 year old man came to us with this asuria and left hemiparesis with repeated hemorrhage. So thinking of the surgical approach, uh, well, uh, here showing a serial CT scan uh, the onset and repeated hemorrhage uh, the patient have. And this is the scan uh, right after admission to a hospital. Uh, seeing the CT scan on the initial stage, the lesion is until located. So I decided to go with, uh, from with the anterior petrosal approach, uh, so-called chaosis approach. I'm afraid the video uh, is visible, maybe not. Uh, with doing the causes, the triangle, then 
uh, peri trigeminal uh, zone is uh, exposed and a pretty small incision. And then each lesion in about uh, four or five millimeters then started to remove uh, gently piece by piece. And now uh, you may not see, but the lesion is uh, gently evacuating and micros uh, high magnification. And then uh, here showing the post of uh, MRI, uh, immediate post of MRI showing a good uh, removal of the lesion. <clears throat> well, uh, the patient had severe severe hemiparesis, hemiparesia beforehand, and after surgery, a little bit in, improved. And regarding the extraocular motion, uh, preoperatively, uh, the uh, severely damaged, but post-op eye movement, extraocular movement is uh, uh, going to improve gradually. And how about a quite similar case, 23-year-old woman in a pontine lesion, repeated hemorrhage, uh, how do we select, how do you select the appropriate surgical approach? I think I did uh, with uh, the same approach as the previous case from anterolateral side, even very close to the fourth ventricle, but still I think it's better to approach uh, from the anterolateral because uh, posteriorly there is a dense uh, nucleus and fibers. So uh, we did surgery with anteropetorosal approach. And <clears throat> I skip video, maybe uh, it doesn't work. So here showing the post-operative MRI and here showing the access route. With this approach, the region with entry is uh, measuring four millimeter and deep, vision is deep still with gentle maneuver, the lesion is totally resected. And postoperatively, uh, the patient had, a week later, the patient uh, walking ambulant without hemiparesis and uh, facial palsy, no palsy, and discharge it. But how about this case? A little bit small, but repeated hemorrhage showing uh, the patient, 54 year old woman. And the lesion is very uh, dorsally and almost uh, uh, reaching the fourth ventricular floor. In this case, in the case like this, I recommend a transverse ventricular approach. Uh, I think uh, Another approach will be applicable, but uh, from anterior is uh, very distant. And from posterior, it's quite uh, almost surface of the fourth vent ventricle. <clears throat> so the point is where to inside the fourth ventricle floor, because uh, here is my senior colleague, uh, Dr. Kyoshima. He presented the uh, nice paper on Journal of Neurosurgery. Uh, he presented, he proposed the safe entry zone, considering the patient uh, facial function, so sparing the facial curriculum uh, during surgery. And here also a very important uh, paper by Professor Bertalanfi. It's uh, even normal, uh, a variation regarding the facial curriculum. So I think the importance is uh, interoperative brainstem mapping and monitoring uh, here's my colleague, Otto, is working on that, the monitoring and mapping on the brainstem. So first step is to identify the facial curriculum by exploding uh, positive ventricular floor. And then monitoring the facial nerve with the transcranial uh, monitoring is available with the help of uh, anesthetologist, neuroanesthetologist. <clears throat> Here is the uh, way. And uh, uh, with this uh, monitoring, we can see the MEP of the facial nerve during resection. So first, 
So with that setup and started to remove first identify, well, uh, this video showing first and the patient prone position and expose the first ventricular floor and identify the uh, facial colloquies by mapping, brainstem mapping. Then start to dissect the sparing the facial colloquies. And then with continuous monitoring, transcortical monitoring of the facial nerve lesion is removed. And here showing the immediate post of uh, CT scan. Here two videos showing the patient has no hemiparesis, no facial weakness after surgery. So, uh, well, uh, this is my comment. Brainstem cavernous malformation can be favorably removed with and the knowledge of brainstem anatomy and a function, an appropriate selection of entry point and precise evaluation of the lesion with electrophysiological monitoring and mapping. And my take home message is lesions in a, uh, regarding the pontine lesion, when the lesion is ventral or middle side, then anterior or anterolateral approach is recommendable. How about uh, dorsally located lesion? Even dorsal side, still anter anterior or anterolateral approach is still recommendable. And transverse ventricular flow approach is, uh, I think, less recommendable. But a pure, purely uh, dorsally located lesion, for that case, well, under brainstem mapping and monitoring, to even transverse ventricular flow approach is uh, applicable quite reasonably uh, uh, with uh, having rather safely uh, as a safe procedure. I think uh, this is my take home message. Usually brainstem uh, transverse ventricular approach is uh, not uh, recommended, but uh, with brainstem mapping and monitoring in the, when the vision is purely located dorsally, then it is applicable. That's, that's my message. Thank you very much for your kind of attention. Sorry for the uh, video. Can I, I cannot show you the video. That's all. Thank you very much. Anyway. Thank you, Dr. Hongo. Fantastic. Unfortunately, your videos we could not see. <laughs> Sorry about I know it is very, it will be very late, but uh, can you sort out the thing uh, with the technical person and you can show the videos maybe at the end or it will be very late in Japan? Uh, now, 9 p.m. But the, I have the WhatsApp from the technical person, and yeah, I'm waiting for his reply. But... Okay, so I will ask yeah. him to call you. Okay. okay. Now, Shekhar, De Pujari. Um, the there are two questions I uh, thought of asking Professor Hongo. Yes. One is this uh, uh, infra tentorial uh, approach to go yes. for the posterior thalamic lesion uh, i mean uh, how, how do you are you largely dependent on navigation or what are your an anatomical landmarks uh, thank you for your question yes uh, both uh, of course anatomical but the navigation system is used because yeah uh, it's quite helpful at the the entry point anatomically it is uh, uh, understandable, but uh, for 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 uh, for sure, uh, I use navigation for this uh, patient, and, and also mapping uh, to to see the cortical spine tract at the time of uh, incising the uh, the cortex. So did you have to incise the uh, tentorium at all or uh, was it possible to do through the hiatus itself? Uh, incised, about five to 10 millimeters incised okay. and exposed the mesial temporal lobe and uh, basal vein and they collect all, th all these things laterally to expose all, uh, quite near to the lateral geniculate body. That is a very, yeah. The second question is about the fourth ventricular floor. I know though initially it was a very popular approach. Uh, the yes. overwhelming majority of patients get sixth and seventh nerve paresis. So 
everybody is talking of taking a lateral approach as far as possible but what do you think of uh, using the tilo wheeler approach uh, go into the uh, you know the fold between the uh, uh, the cerebellar peduncle and the uh, brain stem yeah uh, with tilo wheeler approach or uh, several medial approach i did uh, the transverse ventricular approach to explore the force ventricle Terovera or uh, cerebral, cerebral medial fissure approach is quite useful. Just uh, cutting the tenia bilaterally without splitting the vermis, and then almost uh, fully uh, the force ventricular floor is exposed with Terovera and cerebral medial fissure approach. Yeah, without Thank cutting, you. of course. Perhaps Hango, I, I have. Uh couple of questions. Oh, yes. That, Thank uh, you. Well, whatever cases that I do, a few of the cases I follow that what is called the Spessler two-point entry, that uh, from the middle of the uh, hematoma or the cavernoma till where it is surfacing, and from there up to the bone and the skin, that angle which forms that, that gives the angle of entry, whether it's the lateral approach or a or the midline approach. So I found it to be very useful to select an approach, uh, which way to go. It makes the matter more simple for me. Then, yeah. Uh, yeah. What's uh, your... two, two point approach, uh, it's a Professor Spencer mentioned. Yeah, I think it's quite reasonable. I didn't mention about two point, but the, when I select the approach uh, from the shallowest point, you still uh, need to uh, select the approach where the maximum lesion is easy to be removed. That means uh, the, uh, the long axis, that means uh, Professor Spetzler uh, almost near to the two point uh, approach. Select the approach, uh, thinking of the shape of the lesion. Yes, uh, two point approach is very reasonable. And then my second question is, uh, uh, what is your policy regarding this? Like when the patient comes with the first bleed, do you operate in the first bleed or wait, you wait for the, after the second bleed you operate? What is your policy? Uh, my policy is uh, wait. Uh, I have so far about uh, 45, uh, around 45 cases patient. And I did only one patient uh, with the uh, very, uh, not massive, quite massive, but uh, uh, I mean, the almost uh, emergently, I did surgery in that only one case, but uh, usually my average is about uh, about four to five weeks out, uh, after the breeding. Uh, so I can say a uh, subacute to a rather chronic state uh, regarding the time. One another reason is, uh, I mean, the chronic stage surgeries. Many majority of the patients referred uh, after, uh, not immediately after the breeding, uh, sometime, uh, some period, uh, it's a past then referred. So that is one another reason. But even when I see the patient from the beginning, but I think it's better to wait a little bit. Uh, unless the condition uh, can wait, can be wait. Will you uh, please tell the all the audiences who are listening to you about your uh, opinion about the role of SRS for uh, for cavernomas? Because now quite a few literatures uh, are favoring well, SRS. Yes, uh, well, I think there are various papers uh, uh, supporting or not supporting. And I know some of the doctors are doing SRS for the cavernous malformation, but uh, as far as I know, I don't recommend, uh, but uh, I'm very, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't have much experience, but regarding the literature, I think uh, uh, it's better to do surgery rather than SRS uh, for my uh, quite limited experience and seeing the literatures. 
but the, for the carbonomas which are little deeply situated not really on the surfacing uh, yes. you know, probably on the dorsal side or the ventral side wherever it is then for those uh, for those cases what will be yes. your policy like yeah thank you very much uh, well even SLS is not recommended but the uh, all the deep seated uh, region cannot be always resectable. So for those cases, well, uh, for the brain stimulation, brain stimulation, I think uh, uh, even deep, uh, I think resectable, resectable. Uh, I don't recommend the SRS for the brainstem caverns formation, but the uh, Spracella, uh uh, Splatentural region, uh, so called the deep, deep. I show one case of uh, mid, uh, uh, mid brain to thalamus, but uh, purely thalamic, uh, for example. I think uh, uh, direct surgery is uh, not always uh, uh, good for thinking of the uh, post operative uh, deficit. So uh, I cannot, I don't uh, uh, be rejected against uh, all the SRS uh, procedure, but uh, depending on the cases, but generally speaking, the cabinet malformation on the brainstem, uh, 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 I don't, I don't recommend. Thank you, Professor. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh. Uh, the most your questions in the world. Just I got a phone. Uh, can you hear? Yes. Uh, just I got a phone from Takeo Goto, Professor Goto. Yes. So the, he had an a emergency, the case right now. Okay. Because uh, yeah, he uh, did a, a coldoma case through the transvenoidal. Mm -hmm. But after, after a few hours, uh, some, uh, some, some bleeding of the bench stem. So he okay. went to the, the OR now. So okay. The, we're so sorry to cannot join the, this wonderful meeting. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in the meanwhile, then we'll have uh, our host, uh, Professor Goel, talking to us. And he's going to talk about his favorite uh, subject of uh, trigeminal schwannoma, where he has probably the largest published experience in the world. And uh, I think. Uh, we have uh, learned various ways of how to tackle this uh, problem and i am sure he will have some more experience to add to that today uh, dr goel please okay my dear friends and my dear very important friends i have to talk to you on my on the subject which has been of my great interest for last at least 35 years. And I have developed my neurosurgery over this tumor. As you all know, cavernous sinus has been a subject of my great interest. And cavernous sinus, I have worked for several years in various ways. And today I would like to take you to the world of trigeminal neurinomas. Trigeminal neurinomas are wonderful, wonderful tumors. And as you know, these tumors are relatively rare and they are second only to acoustic neurinoma and they're rarely associated with neurofibromatosis. What I'm planning to do is, I'm planning to show you my strategy as to how these neurinomas can be removed. 25 years, 30 years ago, trigeminal neurinoma and these basal cavernous sinus tumors were you know, they were considered to be inoperable. <clears throat> and uh, with the advent of various MRI investigations and things like that, and the advances in skull-based surgery, now these tumors are very favorite neurosurgeons tumor. And skull-based surgeons just love to see these tumors, as you all know. Just a minute, please. So what I'm going to show you is the management strategy on the basis in 2002 I published this paper on my experience of 73 cases of trigeminal neurinoma 
From 1988 to 2017, my experience was 260 cases. Now in the further three years, my experience is close to 300 cases of trigeminal neurinomas. As you know, this is one of the largest experiences in the world. And I have really enjoyed this work on trigeminal neurinoma, and I would like to show you and share with you my journey on these tumors. So trigeminal nerve is located right in the center of the skull, in the lateral wall of cavernous sinus. This is V2 nerve, this is, this is V1, V2, and V3 is outside the cavernous sinus. This is cranial nerve three, cranial nerve four, and this is the sixth cranial nerve. And the whole thing is located in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Sixth nerve is inside the cavernous sinus. Trigeminal nerve is located on the petrous apex. This is the gastrian ganglion. Then there is division of V1, V2, and V3. Just medially located is the internal carotid artery. And here is the internal carotid artery in, inside the cavernous sinus. So it is, has a very important location right in the center of the skull. And it is a difficult location. These tumors, although they look very simple now, but 25, 30 years ago, they were completely very difficult to you know, evaluate on the basis of CT scan and on the basis of other investigations which were present at that time. The story of trigeminal neurinomas has just you know, is 25 or 30 years old. So I have the pleasure of working with these tumors right in the early infancy of trigeminal neurinoma surgery. So this is the location of trigeminal neurinoma in the, in the lateral wall of cavernous sinus. These tumors are located within the dural confines of the lateral wall of cavernous sinus. This was our understanding which we related first time in the literature that these tumors do not go into the cavernous sinus. They are located within the dural walls of the cavernous sinus. So there are three types of trigeminal neurinomas. One is when it is located in the middle fossa. So middle fossa predominant, this is type one trigeminal neurinoma. Then there are relatively rare posterior fossa trigeminal neurinoma. So posterior fossa predominant trigeminal neurinomas are type two tumors. And these dumbbell shaped tumors are type three tumors. So both in middle fossa and in the posterior fossa. So these tumors were quite difficult 30 years ago because the imaging was not so good. The understanding of the dural anatomy was not good. The understanding of location of this tumor was not proper. And the preoperative diagnosis of the tumor was almost impossible. So these are various kinds of dumbbell shaped tumors part in the middle fossa, part in the posterior fossa. So these are the tumors which have formed a great surgical challenge over the years. This is another dumbbell shaped tumor. And as you can imagine, both in the middle fossa and in the posterior fossa, how to operate these tumors? What are the anatomical subtleties to operate? What are the good points to operate? And what are the dangerous issues in trigeminal neurinoma surgery I would like to discuss in this presentation. So you can see some tumors small in the post middle fossa, large in the posterior fossa, whether to come from this direction, whether to come from this direction, whether to come from middle direction, whether to do petrosectomy, whether to do orbitozygomatic osteotomy, whether to have proximal internal carotid artery control, how to save the cranial nerves involved within the tumor and how to save the cranial nerves outside the confines of the tumor are very crucial and important questions that one faces whilst operating on trigeminal neurinomas. This is type four trigeminal neurinoma when it goes outside the skull cavity, extracranial extension. 
So this is V1 extension. The tumor can go along the V2, can go along the V3 division of the trigeminal nerve. These are also relatively rare trigeminal neurinomas. This is, you see, this tumor is along the this tumor is along the V1 division of the trigeminal nerve. This tumor is along the V2 division. You see along the foramen rotundum by the side of the teeth. And this is V2 division of the trigeminal neuronoma, this tumor. And this is along the foramen ovale, V3, the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. This tumor goes like that. So I will also like to show you what will be the strategy to operate these tumors which are having an extracranial extension. So majority of these tumors are, you see, this is only middle fossa predominant, only posterior fossa predominant. I'm not saying only posterior fossa. And I'm not saying only this is a dumbbell shaped tumors and these are extracranial extension of these tumors. So this is the average kind of uh, numbers. So trigeminal neurinomas are very fantastic tumors and they present with very characteristic symptoms of numbness over the face, wasting of the temporalis and masseter muscle, difficulty in chewing. So these are very characteristic symptoms of trigeminal neurinoma. So they can be small in size as you can see or they can be very huge in size and they can be massive in size. So the, is the anatomy of small tumors different from anatomy of big tumors? That is another question, which I would like to discuss with you. So these tumors can grow into massive proportion. You see huge tumors, but the beauty is you can see in these tumors, there are soft portion, there are necrotic portion, there are cystic portion, there are breakable portions. So essentially, they are not very vascular tumors. They are soft tumors. And more importantly, they are very disciplined tumors. They remain within the confines of the dura. So even these large dumbbell-shaped tumors, whether they are small or whether they are large, they remain within the dural confines in the cavernous sinus relationship. And recently, I also published this article that even the posterior fossa component of the tumor is inside the dura or interdural in large number of cases. I'm not saying in all cases, <clears throat> but a number of cases, even this posterior fossa component of the tumor can be within the dural confines. Even if the tumor has taken a massive proportion, they remain disciplined and the dura is always displaced by the tumor they never enter into the confines of the cavernous sinus. They never, never encase the internal carotid artery which is displaced by the tumor. And these anatomical issues are very much relevant when we are going to operate on these tumors. <clears throat> so this is a huge dumbbell shaped tumor, but you must know that they are interdural, they are soft and necrotic, and they are not vascular, they are not having huge number of blood vessels. They are within the dura, always in this middle fossa and almost always even in the posterior fossa component, they are within the dura. So interdural location of these tumors are absolutely crucial understanding when we are going to operate on these tumors. And we have to also remember that they will never, never encase the internal carotid artery or the basilar artery and never have any major artery within its confines. So that makes these tumors very lovable tumor to operate and very fantastic tumors to operate and benign tumors. So a large number of my cases have been very big in size, many of them are more than six centimeters in size, as you can see in this drawing, and some are small and smaller than two centimeters. So these tumors are of various kinds. You see there are white cystic tumor, blackish tumor. So the cystic component is of different color in different images. 
The other beautiful thing that you will see in this tumor is there is a fluid level within this tumor. So this is a tumor going in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, tumor in the posterior cranial fossa, tumor having a fluid level, and you see the basal artery is displaced, the internal carotid artery is always displaced. So fluid level is also one important thing in these tumors. So now you see this tumor has multiple fluid levels. You see fluid levels on multiple parts. So multiple fluid levels are also rarely seen in these trigeminal neurinomas. So this is a huge trigeminal neurinoma. You see they're huge. And if you see this carefully, there are multiple fluid levels within the cyst of these tumors. You see, if you carefully see this tumor, there are fluid levels at every spot. Every cyst is containing a fluid level and you can see these levels in the tumor. No matter what, whether they are fluid levels or not, whether they are whatever is there, the more important thing is the dura remains intact and that determines how you have to operate these tumors. Bilateral trigeminal neurinomas are also quite common in cases with neurofibromatosis, not otherwise. Otherwise, bilateral are not common. And when to operate these neurofibromatosis tumors and bilateral tumors is also very critical question. All these tumors do not need surgery. It does not mean there is a tumor and you have to operate this tumor. There is a smallish tumor on this side you have to operate. So when to operate, when not to operate is a very critical question in cases with NF2 tumors. This is another case of NF2 tumor. You see this is a large, huge mega acoustic tumor. You can see this one. And this is the trigeminal neurinoma on the other side. So they are almost touching. You Can you believe this tumor is, this acoustic tumor is almost touching the trigeminal neurinoma. And believe me, this patient had come walking with just symptom of ataxia and nothing much, not much symptom, not much symptom related to the acoustic. Of course, hearing was gone in this side and some numbness related to the trigeminal but hardly any symptoms. So in cases with neurofibromatosis, these tumors are slow growing and the brainstem knows how to accommodate this tumor within its brain cavity. So these tumors, when to operate, when not to operate is an issue. They have a very symbiotic relationship with the brain and they are very adjusted to the brain the tumor brain relationship is a beautiful relationship that one has to understand. And this tumor teaches every neurosurgeon the way we have to remove tumors. This is another case of NF2. You see, there is a trigeminal neurinoma, there is a facial, there is an acoustic tumor, there is a facial nerve tumor, there is a fourth nerve tumor which is going like this around the brain stem. And there is another tumor on the acoustic on the other side, you can see here. So multiple tumors are a hallmark of NF2. You have to really, really understand how to operate and what to operate. In my series, I have got four cases of trigeminal neurinoma where there was calcification within these tumors. You see, this is bilateral trigeminal neurinoma and this CT scan shows calcification. I have not seen a single report in the world literature where these tumors have been calcified. So I have got four cases in my series. Now, this is another beautiful case which I have liked to show in my, you know, in my journey with neurosurgery over the years. One trigeminal schwannoma here on one side and one retroorbital hemangiopericytoma. So these two tumors, and believe me, 25 years ago, these tumors, both these tumors were considered to be very difficult or maybe impossible tumors to operate. I operated this tumor 25 years ago and first we removed this orbital tumor and then we removed this trigeminal schwannoma and both these tumors, you see this was a hemangiopericytoma, very vascular tumor. So I removed this one first and this one second and both these tumors are removed and this patient has been surviving for several years without major issue. He has not followed me up with me for last few years, but he has been following up for at least 15 years after surgery without a single symptom. Of course, 
there was symptom of numbness related to the trigeminal nerve. Many of these tumors are present in youngish people, very rarely older people, very rarely in young people, very children, but they are young people's territory. So the more important issue in trigeminal neurinoma is that they have very characteristic clinical presentation. Symptom of numbness in the distribution of the fifth nerve and wasting of the temporalis and masseter muscles are the hallmark of clinical presentation. So when a person presents with, presents with a middle fossa tumor with classical symptom of numbness and wasting, it is trigeminal neurinoma. I can say in majority, if not in all cases of trigeminal neurinoma, by virtue of symptoms, you can diagnose these tumors. So they have characteristic clinical features. In my series, I had presented four cases with such dumbbell shaped tumors with pathological laughter. Now I have more, I don't know how many, but I had presented this article and there are some reports of such large dumbbells presenting with symptom of pathological laughter. So this is unusual, of course. So they are, they are located right in the middle of the skull. This information was not available before the MRI came into picture, the relationship with internal carotid artery, relationship with other cranial nerves and arteries. So this was a complex tumor. Not many people in the world were doing trigeminal neurinoma surgery for these dumbbell-shaped complex approaches had been described. So as I understood the brain, I understood the dura, and many of you have heard me presenting about the dura and the relationship of the dura with the brain and the coverings of the brain. And more importantly, the subject today is covering of the cranial nerves. And many, many of you have heard this sentence from me that meninges are the mother of the brain and we have to respect the mother we have to respect the meninges and we can do several of these tumors. More importantly, these benign tumors which respect the membrane. So trigeminal neurinomas are located in the region of the middle fossa. There is, this is the root of the trigeminal gasserian ganglion, V3, V2, V1, located in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus covered by this majestic mother. And that mother is mother dura and it completely encases the trigeminal nerve. So this is the beautiful trigeminal neurinoma. So in the year 1992, at that time, many of you are very senior people in the audience. Of course, many of you are young people. In 1992, all these tumors were operated in two stages or before 1992. And there were very few people, you know, then Leonard Malice was the first one who described, you know, to operate these tumors by petrosal approach in single stage. But these kind of dumbbell tumors were operated in two stages 30 years ago or before 30 years. This is my case. So this case was one of these cases when I operated in two stages. So I removed middle fossa component first and then posterior fossa component. And this is the two-stage approach that we used to do during this time 30 years ago. This is another case in 1992 where I operated, you see this is a large posterior fossa component. So I went from the posterior fossa, removed this large tumor first, and then I came from the middle fossa, I removed this tumor. So in 1992, my strategy was two-stage approach and then came in, I think in 1989, 1990, Leonard Malice's first article. Then of course, Hakuba came into picture, started talking about petrosal approach. And then various people came into picture and started this journey of trigeminal neurinoma. My concern is my own journey and my own, how I contributed to this subject of trigeminal neurinoma. So in the year 1992, I gave this presentation that surgery on the middle fossa you play with the dura and surgery for the posterior fossa you play with the arachnoid. So the concept was which we started first that this middle fossa component 
is within the dural confines. Even if it is in the cavernous sinus, it is not inside the cavernous sinus. It is not encasing the internal carotid artery. It is displacing the internal carotid artery. So this concept was first initiated by us. The posterior fossa component of the tumor in 1992 and 93, I said that this part is like acoustic tumor and this is intradural or subarachnoid in space in position. But as we understood more, we identified that even this component can be, I'm not saying always, can be completely within the dural confines. I cannot overemphasize, but this concept has completely revolutionized trigeminal neurinoma surgery without any doubt. And nobody should have doubt that the concept that this is within the dura has completely revolutionized trigeminal surgery. I must also tell you that in 19, 30 years ago, trigeminal neurinoma surgery was always accompanied by complete loss of trigeminal sensation. There were very few case reports in the world literature showing that after surgery, trigeminal nerve could be preserved. So this is one very fantastic, beautiful thing that we first wrote as a series that trigeminal, surge, trigeminal neurinoma surgery can result in improvement in trigeminal sensation as a series we demonstrated first time in the literature. And this, you know, as our understanding with the dura came into picture, extra dural approach to various, of course, Winko Dolenz's contribution cannot be undermined in this respect. He wrote about extra dural approach to internal carotid artery aneurysm, extra dural approach to even trigeminal neurinoma. My paper was very simultaneous with Winko Dolan's approach when he wrote on extra dural approach simultaneously, I had written about interdural approach to trigeminal neurinomas. And this book I have kept specially because Hongo is here. I wrote with him in the year 1996 and he will remember all these approaches that we described at that time. So this approach in 1995, we described on the basis of our understanding that trigeminal neurinomas are within the dural confines. They are in the cavernous sinus relationship, but not inside the venous complex of cavernous sinus. They have characteristic symptoms, and you can diagnose that this is trigeminal neurinoma on the basis of symptoms. And I described infratemporal fossa interdural approach for the first time in the literature coming from the infratemporal fossa without a craniotomy. No temporal craniotomy coming like here, opening the Meckel's cave, opening the foramen ovale and coming without opening the skull. So this was de we described in the uh, you know, infratemporal approach. <clears throat> These pictures were in my paper on, uh, in that publication in 1995. So I removed this tumor from the infratemporal fossa approach and working within the dura. Even this posterior fossa component, you see, you can imagine Cushing had written that to operate these tumors which go in two compartments will be the terminal part of neurosurgery, Cushing had written. And even Sam Al-Mefti had written on in one article that dumbbell shaped tumors, and that paper was published as cover page publication, that removal of dumbbell shaped tumor is one of the terminal part of neurosurgery. And you can imagine I removed in 1994 or 93 this tumor without craniotomy coming from, this is my craniotomy around the foramen ovale, no temporal craniotomy. And I removed both the components of these tumors in the year 93 or 94 by understanding the fact that these tumors are within the dural confines. And there is no question that this completely revolutionized trigeminal neurinoma surgery. And this is another tumor in the same series I had in my article, I had removed this without doing any craniotomy by working within the dural confines, infratemporal fossa interdural approach. So this was my article, which was published in 2003. 
And in this article, some beautiful features of trigeminal neuronoma were, number one is, I said that these tumors arise in the region of trigeminal ganglion for the first time in the literature, like internal artery meatus, acoustic tumor arises from the internal artery meatus. Similarly, these tumors arise from the trigeminal ganglion within the dural confines. And once they arise from here, they can go from either remain in the middle fossa or in, go in the posterior fossa, or they can have a dumbbell shape or they can go in the extracranial component. So the basic thing that we described is that these tumors arise from trigeminal gastrin ganglion. The other thing, as I mentioned to you, is we described that these tumors can be associated with preservation of the trigeminal function and improvement in the trigeminal function for the first time as a series we described. Now I want to show you my further on these tumors. I want to show you similar tumors like trigeminal neuronoma before I go to trigeminal neuronomas. This is an oculomotor neuronoma, third nerve neuronoma. Third nerve neuronoma, nobody has really understood because these are very rare tumors. So we described a beautiful, beautiful approach to these tumors on the basis of understanding See, this is the oculomotor nerve. Oculomotor nerve goes into the trigeminal, into the lateral wall of the lateral and superior wall of the cavernous sinus in this way. And there is an oculomotor cistern here. And you can see that cistern, you see the oculomotor nerve is going, and there is an oculomotor cistern, like Meckel's cave. Like we these tumors arise in the oculomotor cistern and when they grow up, when they grow big, they remain within the dura. You see interdural oculomotor neuronoma. So they remain within the dura even when they become huge. They remain within the dural confines. So this concept that you don't have to remove the wall of the tumor, you don't have to remove the capsule of the tumor. This capsule is not the abnormal part, this is dura. And if you work within this tumor, work within the tumor and remove this tumor, preserving the dura, and you know, in the region of the trigeminal, in the region of the oculomotor nerve, to save the and you can preserve the eye function, which has never been reported in the literature. So my concept is that third nerve neuronomas arise within the oculomotor nerve, oculomotor cistern, and they grow and the dura is preserved around the tumor in a huge number of oculomotor neuronomas. So this is another oculomotor neuronoma. You see the dura is completely preserved. And you can actually see the dura around the tumor. So what you have to do is, this is not the capsule of the tumor. This is the dura. You work within the dura and you can remove this tumor and you can attend. I'm not saying you can do, you can save the oculomotor function in all these cases, but in a number of cases, you can actually preserve the function of oculomotor nerve in some cases at least. Now I want to show you another beautiful tumor Seven nerve neuronoma. You see, seven nerve tumor, seven nerve neuronomas are completely not understood in the literature. So we reported for the first time in the literature that these tumors arise within the geniculate ganglion. And when they grow, they grow in the interdural compartment. So this geniculate middle fossa compartment is within the dura and the posterior fossa compartment is also within the dura. My dear friends, believe me that this understanding of the dural relationship of the seventh nerve is absolutely critical to operate on these tumors. So you come from the lateral perspective, open the dura and work within the dura 
do not try to remove the capsule or this is not the capsule this is the dura of the tumor and try to work in the middle part medial part in the relationship of the seventh nerve and you can actually try to save the seventh nerve so we describe that facial neuronomas arise within the geniculate ganglion and even if they become huge even if they become massive they remain within the dural confines they will not touch the internal carotid artery which is very closely in relationship at the petrous apex they will not even venture there is a big line of dissection which you can develop from the tumor and the internal carotid artery and so these tumors arise from the geniculate ganglion and interdural approach is the fantastic approach to these tumors so this is the you know these are the nerves and this is the dura so if the tumor arises from the nerve the dura remains intact so that is the principle and recently we have described another beautiful beautiful approach for the low cranial nerve neuronoma see these are the low cranial nerves so we describe that low cranial nerve neuronomas arise within the jugular foramen relationship here extra cranial is the origin of low cranial nerve neuronoma and believe me this understanding that low cranial nerve neuronomas can be within the dura even the intracranial part of the dura has completely revolutionized the surgery on low cranial nerve tumors professor kawase has also talked about low cranial nerve tumors and dura but recently our publication suggests that intracranial component jugular bulb component and extracranial component of the tumor are all within the dura and not they are not within the cap they are you know there is no capsule of the tumor preservation of the dura avoiding the region of the lower cranial nerve you can get fantastic clinical results so this is the tumor the dura is preserved here the dura is preserved here the dura is preserved in the jugular bulb region and the dura is preserved in the extracranial component of the tumor and you work within the tumor work within the tumor and you can avoid the cranial low cranial nerves which are on the surface of the dome of the tumor and you can remove these tumors beautifully and you can give new life to the person and the lower cranial nerve function should actually improve after surgery and if there is some issue in removal of the tumor on the bottom half of the capsule you have to leave some tumor because that is the part which is most adherent to the lower cranial nerves so these tumors if you carefully see there is a dural covering of the tumor in the extracranial compartment in the jugular bulb area in the intracranial compartment these are all completely interdural tumors and you can you see work within the dura and you can save the dura and remove the tumor in a very fantastic fashion so these tumors arise in the region of jugular bulb they go inside the skull they go outside the skull but they take the dura along with the tumor so this is another tumor and if you carefully see it is very difficult for me to show you but there is a dural covering of this tumor this is the tumor there is a dura this a is the dura and the, this is the tumor now i want to talk to you about another beautiful tumor you see these are spinal neuronomas arise in the ganglion this is another observation which has not really been described in the literature spinal like c5 neuronoma dorsal neuronomas they arise in the region of ganglion and then they go inside or outside the sc spinal canal now this is the ganglion in the subaxial spine this c2 ganglion is outside the skull c2 ganglion is behind the atlantoaxial joint and it is outside the spinal canal it is outside the neural canal rest of the ganglion are within the neural canal intervertebral foramen but this is outside the intervertebral foramen <clears throat> so we said that these tumor c2 neuronomas arise within the ganglion 
You see C2 ganglion is associated very closely with the vertebral artery. And also there are huge venous plexuses in this region. So understanding the fact that C2 neurinoma will be within the dura is completely beautiful surgery you can do. So I have written several articles on this. So in the year 2008, I published this series of 60 cases where I said, you please see my understanding in the year 2008, I said, like for trigeminal neurinoma, that there are three components of these tumors. Component A is intradural or subarachnoid in situation. Component B and C are interdural in location. This was my understanding in the year 2008. In the year 2018, my understanding was different. And we said that even this, this component, this part in the spinal canal is also interdural in location and very rarely intradural or subarachnoid. You see this another series of 50 cases and 60 cases. These tumors are one fascinating tumors. You open the dura, work within the dura, and you can do a very quick surgical resection. And you can very be very sure that vertebral artery will be located outside the dural confines, and you can work within the dura and remove this tumor. This vertebral artery is very close to these tumors, and sometimes you have very real scare about the vertebral artery. So this is C2 neurinoma. This was my understanding in 2008 that there are three components of C2 neurinoma, and this was my understanding in 1995 about trigeminal neurinoma, similar finding, that there are three components. But of course, now my understanding is that this is also intradural and a large number of tumors, this is also intradural. You can save the fifth nerve. And of course, C2 nerve is not very important nerve. If you damage, there is nothing much in that nerve. So this is C2 neurinoma. Even this component is intradural. And you can see beautifully that this component is also intradural. The whole thing is within the dural confines. No matter how big this tumor becomes, work within the tumor, work within the dura, and you can do a fantastic surgery by removal of this tumor. So this is C2 neurinoma. You see the whole thing is within the dura. And this is trigeminal neurinoma. The whole thing is within the dura. It will never encase the basal artery, never, never encase the internal carotid artery. Working within the dura is very crucial in these cases. Like bilateral trigem, bilateral C2 neurinoma, bilateral trigeminal neurinomas are also associated with NF2. Like extracranial extension, C2 neurinomas can also go very anteriorly and very medially. So these are very similar tumors arise within the ganglion, trigeminal neurinomas arise within the gasserian ganglion, third nerve neurinoma arise within the oculomotor system, facial nerve neurinoma arises within the geniculate ganglion, and lower cranial nerve neurinoma arise within the jugular bulb. So these are the, our observations which we have literature. So this is the, as regards trigeminal neurinoma, which is the main subject of today's discussion, in the year 1996, I described this approach where we amalgamated middle fossa with the mastoidectomy. So this was my removal of the root of the zygoma, root of the condyle, roof of the external ear canal, little bit of mastoidectomy. So we incorporated mastoidectomy for the first time in the literature in middle fossa approaches. So this basal extension of the middle fossa approach we publish and we used to do trigeminal neurinomas by this kind of approach. But of course, now I don't need such a large exposure. Subsequently, I have started doing just this much exposure by splitting of the temporalis muscle anteriorly and posteriorly and small craniotomy in the basal subtemporal area and working within the dura, working within the dura. Of course, I don't now come from the infratemporal fossa. I come basal subtemporal work within the dura and remove the posterior fossa component and middle fossa component in one single stage, almost always. You know, you remember my word, almost always. Sometimes when there is a huge posterior fossa component, I may go for a posterior fossa approach, but in general, 
all my approaches are middle fossa. So many of these trigeminal neuronomas are very soft tumors. They are necrotic tumors. And they always have a dura here. And the internal carotid artery is displaced on the medial surface of this tumor. The petrous apex artery is displaced inferiorly and working within the dura, avoiding most important cranial nerve in this situation will be V1 division of the fifth nerve. If you damage the fifth nerve V1 division, you have completely sacrificed the eye. You have to come from the base, open the dura, identify a weak spot in the gaps in the between the layers of the tumor and then work within the tumor and remove this. These tumors can be absolutely simple and safe neurosurgical operation. This is another tumor. And believe me, many of these tumors can be done in 20 minutes or half an hour if you know exactly how to work within the dura. They are not terribly vascular tumors. They are not, you don't have to coagulate within the tumor. You don't have to coagulate outside the tumor. Just demolish the tumor by breaking the tumor and preserving the dural walls and the internal carotid artery will be saved without any issue. Don't think that it is the capsule and remove the dura. And if you do that, you will definitely damage the cranial nerves. And if you work, know how to demolish the tumor, debulk the tumor, once you have debulked it enough, the trigeminal nerves will come into picture and then you can save this tumor. <clears throat> you see this tumor interdural, the whole thing interdural, and this is, there is no drilling done. You see the anterior clinoid is already eroded by the tumor. All this bone has been already eroded by the tumor. So you don't need to do any additional bone work. You work within the tumor and learn how to break the tumor. Don't waste your time in continuously coagulating these tumors. Because if you do coagulation multiple times in the in the bulk of the tumor, you will certainly damage the fifth nerve fibers, which are very delicate fibers. So these have got, you know, as I've shown you over the years, several fantastic number of cases that I have done pre-operative, post-operative. And many of you have seen these cases in various presentation for last 30 years. I'm talking of trigeminal neurinomas. I'm talking about cavernous sinus tumors, of course, this is not exactly cavernous sinus tumor, so I have not really involved discussion on how to work in cavernous sinus, but outside the cavernous sinus, open the dura, work within the tumor, and you can have a fantastic, and this tumor I had done in 1991. You see this tumor, beautiful resection, and you can have, and these are very, very benign tumors. Recurrence rates are extremely low, and recurrence rate, in my cases of nearing 300 cases, there are 11 cases of recurrence. Many of them are recurrent because of the tumor. Tumor was cystic in nature and recurrent tumor with such necrotic part of the tumor are more prone to recurrence. Now you see this nubbin which is going inside like this, you will feel that this is going into the cavernous sinus, but there is also dura. These tumors will never, never, digress the boundaries. You see there is dural cover here and the trigeminal, the roots of the trigeminal nerves can be saved if you don't do too much coagulation. You work within the tumor, debulk the tumor, and then you find the entire trigeminal nerve can be preserved and the trigeminal sensations will improve after surgery. This is a case with multiple fluid levels as I've shown you, and such tumors are more prone for recurrence. This is one pre-op, post-op. So I've got several, several cases of huge, mega huge, and large and small. And this has been a very fantastic journey with these tumors. You see this predominantly in the posterior fossa. I'm not sure if I would like to come in this case by the middle fossa root, I will like to come posterior fossa. So predominant posterior fossa tumors can be removed from the posterior fossa component. Even the Meckel's cave part can be removed by dilating the region of Meckel's cave without any major issue. So this is another huge <clears throat> trigeminal neurinoma and has been removed. Bottom line is, the basic line is, that these tumors are within the dural confines. So this is another tumor. 
cystic tumor and this was operated by somebody and then I had also operated and there was a huge recurrence in this tumor. And this is the part of the recurrent tumor, which was after some years. And I have recently reported about recurrence of trigeminal neuronomas. This is another tumor with, you see this recurrence, this patient has been operated and there is a recurrence and then I reoperate these large cystic tumors are prone for recurrent trigeminal neuronomas. This is another huge tumor. And I'm not sure what approach I took, but I think this is a largely posterior fossa component. Retrosigmoid approach may be a fantastic operation for this tumor. Extracranial extension of these tumors are rare. I had reported in my series 28 cases with extracranial extension. Now I will give you one beauty for this extracranial extension that even this extracranial extension has a dural cover. And respecting the dural cover, you can remove this tumor by working extra intradurally. So if you read this article, intradural, and you can actually remove this tumor from the nasal cavity also. But I like to do a reverse skull base approach for an extracranial tumor going transcranial. I have found those, that approach a very beautiful approach. So extracranial tumor also have a dural cover and you can do a cranial approach to extracranial tumors. So this is another extracranial tumor in a case of NF2 and you have to decide when to do and when not to do these tumors. These tumors are fantastic tumors. These multi-segmental, multi-compartmental tumors are also prone to recurrence and these are more aggressive. When the tumor occupies more than one compartment, it is more aggressive tumor. So my dear friends, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the journey, my life with trigeminal neuronomas. This has been a wonderful journey and I hope you have loved my journey with these tumors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Atul, for a, as usual, beautiful presentation. It's really your journey to this trigeminal schwannoma, as we all know, and we have heard in several conferences, and your experience is amazing, and it's a learning experience for all of us. So thank you very much for your presentation. I think the take home message for the young neurosurgeon should be that as he said rightly that this trigeminal swanomas are within the two lips, of the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. So the most important as he said that you should not breach the dura, especially the medial part of the dura, as you know. So then only as he said, rightly that most of the time you can improve the uh, outcome of the patient's trigeminal sensations. So that is something which is amazing, probably that we, we should not transgress the dura layer. That is very important for the message for most of the young neurosurgeons who have been listening this. And another thing that he said is that you should not coagulate too much. Fortunately, as we all know that these tumors are not very vascular and they're soft. So it's not necessarily, you don't really need to use much of the, you know, the, uh, coagulation. So as the young people always, we know the young people, when we are also young, we used to use a lot of bipolar. So we try to avoid that because the most important thing and the most, you know, the satisfactory thing for this tumor, if we can save those uh, cranial nerves, as he said, rightly, if the patient comes with a V1 deficit and patient develops a corneal ulcer, then definitely that's the end of the surgery the patient will suffer throughout their life. So that's very important thing. Uh, one of the approaches that Atul, I want to share with you that predominantly this posterior fossa large tumor, like you go a pure retrosigmoid, but what I sometimes, what I do, I do a, just a little bit of pre-sigmoid and retro lap. I just say very small, we get about two to three millimeter of dura uh, in front of the, you know, sigmoid sinus, and that gives, uh, in my experience, that gives an amazing, quite a bit of good uh, corridor to get the tumor out. When also for the tumor, which goes, you know, through the uh, Meckel's cap to the to the middle fossa. I would like to ask your opinion regarding this. Yeah, yeah, petrosal approach, of course, is a very 
uh, you know, is a just a pre sigmoid, not the yeah. whole, just a uh, yeah. posterior pre sigmoid approach. Pre, pre sigmoid retro. Pre sigmoid, yeah. Retro pre is a very fantastic approach for many petroclival meningiomas in particular. You see, as I have not mentioned really in my this presentation, I used to do a lot of petrosal, petrous bone drilling and a lot of petrous work. And I have also described facial nerve mobilization. I have also described internal carotid artery mobilization and various kinds of transpetrosal approach I was doing early in my career. But over the years, you know, see that what has happened is I have got a little bit used to these problems a little bit more. And uh, I don't really do any kind of petrosal bone drilling at present. But of course, uh, it was a, there is no question petrous bone drilling and what you say about pre sigmoid and retro labyrinthine approach is a fantastic approach. And uh, I don't uh, discount it. But I, if you ask me, I don't do it. Shekhar, you have to say something? Uh, there was a question on the question box. Uh, uh, what is your opinion about uh, intraoperative monitoring for trigeminal schwannoma? See, monitoring can be done for all the cases and monitoring may be recommended for all the cases. We will ask Dr. Hongo's opinion. Hongo, what do you say about uh, monitoring in uh, trigeminal schwannoma? Hongo, you are there? Yes, yes. Okay, Hongo, unmute, yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, regarding traditional uh, monitoring, as far as I know, uh, there's no... For uh, trigeminal, it is not so... Uh, is it reliable? I, no, no, not yet. Not, not yet. Uh, there's no good report of uh, successful monitoring of the traditional as far as I know. Okay. So what I will like is, I will like Yoko Kato to give some nice comments. Yoko, you are there? Yoko. Yes, I'm here. So. <laughs> yes, so I want to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, what wonderful to talk. Thank you very much. Thank but, you, um, I, I, yeah, I don't have much so oh, the cases of the trigeminal schwannoma. So, but uh, I, I think uh, uh, the Hongo mentioned about the monitoring is uh, still not, uh, uh, I think, uh, not so reliable. Yeah. Thank you. Albert, you want to say something, Albert? Yeah. Uh, uh, fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot Thank of experience, you, and, uh, especially for us, for my my uh, residents of my Federal Center of Neurosurgery. And uh, we also have uh, now a neurophysiology team. And, but uh, in this case, uh, I agree with Professor Yotokata. Before we go to Albert, I will like uh, Bin. Bin, can you say something? Professor yeah, Zhu. I have a good news for you. Actually, uh, I noticed that uh, in the WeChat channel, Yes. yes. Uh, more than 500 Chinese neurosurgeons are watching your presentation. Okay. Nice. Very nice. Okay, yeah. <laughs> big, big uh, uh, spread of the education. Uh, so, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Ipe yeah. is silent. Ipe has something to say? Yeah, Ipe. Yeah. Ipe, you have to say something? How are you doing? All my, I can see all my friends, Albert, Professor Kato, I can see all of them. Um, I generally, I, uh, for these vaginal schwannomas, I use a small... DNA. Need to speak louder, I... Uh, can you, can you hear me now? Can you hear yeah. me? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, so for these uh, tumors, I generally use a small tyrional craniotomy and I do the... Uh, peeling of the cavernous sinus and the tumor is right there. So exactly what uh, Professor Goyle was showing about uh, the interdural approach. So uh, beautiful lecture. Uh, I learned a lot from uh, his lecture. Thank you so much, sir. Thank I think you. Lucky wants to say something. Lucky, you are on the line. Lucky. Hi, hi. Yes, of course. Enjoying the feast as always and. Uh, 
we we unfortunately don't have that big experience like uh, atul and as i always say is blessed with everything that a neurosurgeon needs to have on this earth the numbers the quality of the brain the technique the publication the experience the friendship well wish wisher so all over the world so we can share and celebrate his uh, number of cases success but yes uh, he is rightly shown we done some spinal uh, C2 neuronomas and uh, some uh, small group of trigeminal neuronomas. He is very right, and we all have realized with time that it's uh, we feel the dura; it is interdural. So, uh, and his beautiful technique of showing springing out of the uh, neuronomas on in workshops is absolutely classic. You blink, and the tumor is out. <laughs> so, uh, I I always warn my colleagues. that don't reach the place late by the time you have your breakfast there will be two tumors out so that's a mammoth surgeon as our friend atul is there are so many brilliant surgeons on this panel i'm very happy to see all our senior people from japan china and of course ip uh, he has got a good news i will keep it secret <coughs> he just told me so thanks very much sudha and uh, it's a brilliant uh, evening time and enjoy we enjoying the discourse by all the uh, you know brilliant speakers thanks to dr kato thanks to dr ango we met him in uh, his unit in machimoto and uh, his brilliant Please. experience thank you atul thank you thank you so now i, I will Shall yes, I Hongo. then introduce yes. uh, ango 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 is asking a question uh, yeah just one question uh, for uh, how about post operative uh, Trigeminal function. Yes. How about the uh, yes. some numbness or paralysis? You see, the trigeminal tumors always come with numbness. They always come with wasting of the temporalis and the masseter muscle. That is the presenting symptom. Numbness will never improve hundred percent. Wasting will never improve hundred percent. Wasting once wasting always wasting once numbness. numbness will improve so my answer is that trigeminal sensation will improve but they will never come back normal and if you damage the v1 division you have damaged the complete eye so the sensation should improve and this concept was never there hongo in the literature in in 30 years ago that the sensation of the face can improve after surgery mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. Should so, we? Uh, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, Doctor Dev Pujari, go ahead. Uh, then I have pleasure to introduce Albert Sufianov. He is the chief of neurosurgery at uh, Tumen in Siberia, the second biggest unit in uh, the Republic of uh, uh, Russian Federation. And uh, he is going to talk to us about his experience of intraventricular tumors. one of the areas i am also interested in about the endoscopic uh, treatment how it has enhanced uh, the management uh, and uh, radical excision of intraventricular tumors albert yeah. please yeah okay thank you very much you see my my presentation okay yeah it's okay yes yes okay i am from tumen and thank you very much for a big honor for me Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Atul Go, to invite me to share our small personal experience in this kind of surgery. And uh, I am from uh, Siberia. This is our city. It means very nice city. And I present the experience of the Federal Center of Neurosurgery. This is a very new project of our president. And uh, this center uh, treats only high-level uh, neurosurgical uh, disease and uh, patients. Uh, and the uh, endoscopic treatment of intraventricular tumors why is it possible because we have uh, some necessity uh, possibilities uh, large cavities we have large cavities this is ventricles second one transparent medium we have the cerebrospinal cerebral uh, spinal fluid and also in this uh, time we have very modern endoscopic equipment and the uh, 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 perspective for the development of this endoscopic equipment all these possibility uh, uh, all these uh, conditions give us uh, possibilities to do endoscopic 
treatment of intraventricular tumors about my opinion. Since 1999 until uh, this time, we operate uh, near the, uh, 100 patients uh, with this endoscopic technique. And uh, we need good equipment uh, for this kind of surgery. And uh, this is uh, my operation room, the U and the position of the surgeons for, for this kind of surgeon. And the most important because it's uh, not standard surgery, endoscopic surgery. So maybe you need long time and maybe some uh, difficult situation, so you must need a very, uh, very useful position for the surgeons and uh, uh, relax uh, for relaxed position for the surgeon. You see the eyes and the levels on the uh, screen must be one level, for example, and so on. Uh, what equipment we use for this kind of surgery? We use uh, it depends from the kind of the surgery and the, and we use a rigid endoscope flexible endoscope and semi region very new one is uh, I developed with the Storz company the special kit for this kind of surgery. I show you later. Uh, we use two, two kinds of endoscopes, the space endoscope like a gap endoscope and the channel endoscope like a lot endoscope. Uh, sometimes in, uh, uh, when we need to remove big piece of the, of the tumors, I use the space endoscope because in the, you see the big space and it's possible to remove piece by piece, uh, big piece of tumor, for example. But for more precise, uh, for more precise manipulation, we need, uh, or especially for B manual manipulation, B manual is very important. You you show you next. We use this canal endoscope. It's in this uh, kind of endoscope, it's possible to use B manual. You see the two canal, possible to use, uh, for example. The manual manipulation, like a microscope. This is our kit and uh, uh, instruments and our tower, endoscopic tower. Very important now to use uh, flexible video scope. It's not a standard uh, video scope, uh, uh, flexible endoscope. This is a this is a video scope. So, so why this is a new device and the, and the special chip. It's on the tip of the on, on the of the video scope and the uh, the picture uh, the quality of the picture is very beautiful amazing compared to the like a, a rigid endoscope so it's possible now to use uh, very widely in this kind of surgery also uh, very important is uh, fixation of course and especially in the kit we use uh, we use this kind of fixation frame with the possibility of the neural navigation also because uh, most important in this kind of surgery is the orientation inside of the ventricle. Uh, we use uh, two technique. One is freehand technique and another is the fixed technique. Fix for fix for endoscope because sometimes a long time of watching need we I use uh, the, this Mitaka. Mitaka holding device. I, I, I think this is one of the most beautiful holding device for this kind of surgery. Also very, uh, very, very perspective use, use uh, um, uh, navigation system, but for this kind of surgery, I prefer ultrasound navigation uh, system. Ultrasound because uh, when you open the, 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 the ventricles, the CC go out and send this as shift syndrome as possible. So why uh, uh, update in real time with ultrasound is very useful in this kind of surgery. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, sorry. Also we use the navigation uh, system for the, the sheet of endoscope, you see, and it's also very useful before surgery before surgery, it's very important. And the, what uh, some perspectives, the technique, uh, technique we use also, we use in this kind of surgery. Uh, first one is uh, the free, uh, 3D endoscope, you see? And sometimes in difficult case where, where no uh, landmark inside of the ventricles, uh, it's possible orientation only by the relief relief of the uh, inner uh, surface of the ventricle. So why in this kind of surgery, this 3D endoscope may be very useful. And sometimes I use this. 
this one. Another very best perspective tools now, what I use very widely, and I start use maybe next uh, last two years. This is a surgical laser. And you see uh, my, my, my device in my, my hospital, this is a Tulium surgical laser. It's uh, very powerful, 150 watt. And you see uh, how I use this uh, laser. I see my endoscope, what I developed with Storz, system, with Storz company, you see? And it's possible to introduce this uh, very thin, very thin, you see the 550 mic micron uh, uh, device inside of the uh, uh, working canal. And you see, this is the laser inside of the sheet of the endoscope. And by this, and by this uh, very thin endoscope, it's possible to operate inside of the without the, without the limit of the age of the patient and without the limit of the size of the ventricle. Also. Also very useful uh, hybrid ICT operation room. The, uh, what options is possible in this uh, uh, transventricular tumor surgery? The main options is uh, a total pure endoscopic removal, first one, partial pure endoscopic removal, biopsy, endoscopic assisted removal tumor, and the management of secondary hydrocephalus. Or maybe combine all these uh, all these uh, options. Maybe combine total pure with the management of secondary hydrocephalus. It depends from the situation. But options and choose of option of possible options depends on from anatomical future of the ventricles. So you must know very well anatomy and anatomical nuances. Uh, localization of the tumor, lesion, size of the ventricle and lesions. Very important is uh, for the choice of the option is the vascular supply and your possible access to the vascular supply of the tumor before uh, touching the tumor. And the uh, one important is the experience of the surgical team. So learning curve is very important. So uh, anatomical nuances uh, you must know inside of the cadaver lab and this is uh, some specimens you must very well understand in the Monroe septum pellucidum and, uh, and the uh, third ventricular anatomy, anterior wall, for example, and main 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 and main and main landmark, anterior wall, posterior wall. For example, this is a specimen of the uh, uh, anterior wall of the third ventricle, because in some difficult cases this uh, area is distorted for by the tumor, and uh, some landmark is uh, disappear. For this, uh, I, uh, I developed some endoscopic classification, for example, third ventricle, and this is very useful for orientation inside of uh, uh, during the surgery. And before, and before before surgery, you must estimate the localization of the tumor in, by this classification. Also, very important in was uh, before surgery. Uh, now uh, we now we create a simulator. We create a simulator uh, for uh, for tumor. So we, we we create by 3D print a personal model of the tumor, and we and we sorry, and we train before and we train before uh, by endoscope. Uh, on, 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 sorry, on the model, you see like this. So open the dura and step by step. For uh, mass better orientation, what kind of tumor? This is the tumor you see. What kind of tumor uh, and what kind of options you must uh, choose before operation? And uh, how many ports we might need, and uh, what trajectory is more uh, more safe? Second one is before uh, surgery is uh, virtual planning. Uh, um, after choosing the, the ports, you must understand uh, more orientation by VR inside of the ventricle. You go inside of the ventricle. 
go around the tumor and uh, to create in your mind very clear the localization of the tumor, the localization of the vascular peduncle, for example, and uh, so on. You see, like this. And all after that, when you uh, start to create approach by the some um, program. For example, we use uh, very widely now mesh mixer, and we create the uh, the, the, the virtual uh, port for endoscope. And it's enough, not enough. It's uh, uh, necessary only one port or maybe more ports for endoscope by mesh mixer. Only after this preparing, we go to the surgery. So uh, now we have a lot of approaches to the uh, ventricles, you see on this slide. So you must choose before uh, by virtual planning of the operation and by operation in, uh, model, printing by in 3D print. So uh, it's possible to uh, use um, uh, some kind of approach it depends from tumor localization. You see on this slide, if tumor localization from foreign monoregion, frontal uh, foreign body, uh, third ventricle, and so on. So we use uh, anterior transventricular approach, for example, for the posterior part uh, of third ventricle, for example, or anterior horn localization. We use yeah, transmitter yeah. approach uh, mainly for the flow of the third ventricular tumors. And we use uh, widely, <coughs> widely uh, posterior transmitter approach for the tumor localized in uh, atrium, posterior horn, uh, glomus, and so on, or inferior horn. Uh, possible to use monoportal or multi-portal approach. It depends from the localization of the tumor and the vascular supply. It's possible access to vascular supply, not possible by one portal. If it's possible, if uh, possible access uh, by the one port, we use monoportal approach. It's not possible, we use uh, multi-portal, B-Vintergo, uh, for example, multi-portal approach. Uh, if tumor localized in one uh, hemisphere, this is a monoventricle multiportal approach. Is uh, uh, tumor localized in two uh, ventricles, a biventricle approach. This is a view of our monoportal approach. This is only one port with navigation system, and this is the uh, biportal approach. You see, one port, second port for this kind of surgery. This is our preparation of our OP for the biportal approach. This is the two, uh, two endoscopic tower. And to see, to see Mitaka, two Mitaka and so on. Uh, also very important is uh, the, the incision and the entry point, and localize the entry point. Uh, also, uh, as I showed you before, we use uh, a virtual planning very widely now, you see, because it's very important uh, entry point just to reach the tumor without damage structure inside of the brain. Next is uh, some uh, cases, uh, our experience of this kind of surgery. So endoscopic monoportal resection or biopsy. This is the case, the close uh, inside of the, uh, inside of the, uh, uh, Monro close into asymmetric hydrocephalus. We go inside. This is the uh, anterior horn, and this is the holy plexus, septal vein. At first, in uh, every case, you must have in your mind good orientation. In this case, because I don't know, it's possible for me, not possible to remove and open two monro and first step, I manage secondary hydrocephalus. So I open septum pellucidum. And I see, I use the bipolar forceps and very widely, very widely, I open septum. And you see the contralateral ventricle. So after that, after that, it's possible to dissect and remove or biopsy this tumor was blocked 
זה כל המון מונו. Because if even not possible for us to remove, to open Monroe, septal stomy uh, uh, give us possibility to treat the patient. At first, dissect by the uh, scissors, not only, uh, we use not only for the cutting, but also for dissection, very precise dissection, you see. Dissect, dissect and open. And then uh, removed tumor, partially removed the tumor and open the monroe. Coagulate, shrink, shrink the vessel. For, and you see now we completely open monroe. After operation. We could, because we saw so limiting time, so maybe next next uh, case is endoscopic monoportal partial removal also. This is the case, the big case. Inside the lateral ventricle, you see. And in this uh, kind of patient of uh, disease, we, uh, at first step of our surgery, we decide to endoscopic partial resection of this tumor. This is a big tumor inside. At first, we open widely cyst. You see by coagulation, aspirate the cyst contents. Aspirate. And then we create big fenestration for this kind of we use the coagulation. Sorry. You see the fenestrating fenestration and partially remove the tumor. This is after operation. Uh, most interested in this kind of surgery is the endoscopic monoportal total removal of the tumor, also possible now. Most standard uh, situation is uh, the colloid cyst. How we remove colloid cyst endoscopically. You see the uh, colloid cyst inside the third ventricle. First is simulation, and then we go inside of the lateral ventricle. You see the very narrow Monroe, colloid cyst, colloid plexus, septal vein. And first step is the open the colloid cyst. Coagulation of the colloid plexus, just to open the colloid cyst more widely. Little bit coagulates the wall of the colloid cyst. The aim of this uh, kind of manipulation is to uh, aspirate the contents just to mobilize the wall of the uh, wall of the colloid cyst. Because only if you mobilize the wall of the colloid cyst, it's possible to manipulate. For this kind of uh, purpose, we, we use, uh, you see the bimanual uh, manipulation. You see the forceps and the one forceps uh, holds the wall cyst, and another is the cut of the content and the wall. You see the bimanual manipulation. But still not enough mobilization of the colloid cyst. So we again aspirate and aspirate. And you see bimanual, bimanual manipulation again. Again and again, more and more. Only after total removal of the content, it's possible to remove totally and manipulate, you see? We take out the cyst and then cut, coagulate and cut base. 
total removed and calculate the vessels. Inside of the, this is totally removed. Another case of the total removal. This is uh, also the uh, not easy case, uh, holy place papilloma, very vascularized and, uh, and not en uh, and enough in the size, big size in the third ventricle tumors. You see. Also, before we calculate entry point, and now we operate endoscopically. At first, I go inside of the third ventricle and see the, this is a mammillary body. And first, I uh, restore the CSF circulation because I don't know before it's possible for me to remove or not possible to remove uh, uh, tumor. So I open the floor of the third ventricle and create the CSF pathway. Restore, restore it. This is the economic step of this operation. This is a standard ETV, standard ETV with the Fogarty catheter and go inside to see it's uh, completely enough. And only after that, I go to the third ventricle and see the tumors, possible to remove, not possible to remove. So why? Also again, dissection, coagulation, shrinking, tumor, use forceps, knives, uh, coagulation device. And again, you see the b manual manipulation. It's very useful in this kind of surgery, like in microscope. Coagulate, shrink, and then by aspiration tube, I fixate it and remove. From the operation, from uh, operation sheet. After removal, I, I check the third ventricle, no hemorrhage, no destruction of the nervous system inside. And you see after patients, total removal, total. Few endoscopic, only one bar, uh, bar, bar hole, only one port, bar hole. And just, uh, after two days, uh, this uh, baby discharged from the hospital. You see only small, only small wound. Just only one, two, centi one centimeter, oh, not only. Another case, uh, hamartoma third ventricle, gelastic epilepsy. You see the also uh, not easy localization for open surgery. So why I decide to operate endoscopically, pure endoscopic. One bar hole, just five, six millimeters only. Go inside of the third ventricle and you see now the wall of the third ventricle and the tumor. And now I start to disconnect this tumor from the wall of the third ventricle. Use also coagulation probe and disconnect. Coagulation, shrinking, dissection, you see dissect. I'm oh, sorry. This is the wall of the third ventricle, this is a tumor. Dissect. Also, water dissection, we use also, water dissection. And uh, by the forceps, piece by piece, we remove the tumor from the third ventricle. Piece by piece.
you see the piece of the tumor. Again, piece. Again, remove. You see the structure of Falumna? Monroe, you see the Monroe, it's very narrow in this case. And even by these steps, it's possible total removing of the tumor, total, piece by piece. You see now completely last piece. You see the mammary body, preliminary membrane also possible to see. This is the last piece. Very well, you see mammary body now. Completely total removing of the tumor. You see, completely total, mammary body, pre-mammary membrane. Now it's completely open. This is after operation, total removal of the tumor. Seizure completely disappear after surgery. Okay, maybe limit in time, so. Endoscopic, uh, another uh, topic is endoscopic biportal or multiportal total removal of the tumor. Also possible now. You see the case also, very small baby, six months only, with the very huge holy papilloma inside of the third ventricle. And not only in third ventricle, a, a growth also in the lateral ventricle also. You see. Completely feel third ventricle. Biportal approach, you see the tumor. You see the tumor inside of the lateral ventricle. Piece by piece, we removed. You see? But in this kind of surgery, we use new new eyes. You see the sec from second port, I use Liga Shoes forceps. Liga Shoe coagulation forceps, you see. I manipulate from two ports. At first, coagulate by Liga Shoe. After that, remove this piece of the tumor. Very useful technique, you see. But again, Liga shoe, first step, coagulate and cut, and then remove. Liga shoe, coagulate and cut, part of the piece, you see, and then remove. This is a Liga shoe, coagulation and cutting forceps. From one port to another port. This is B port, by portal approach. Very easy, very safely, and without the in, without completely without blood. And very fast. You see the Total removal, total removal. Only two bar hole. Another case, endoscopic biportal removal of the tumor. You see the tumor inside of the ventricle. 
This is two port. This is another technique by clipping, not by calculation, sorry. Clipping technique. You see very big peduncle with the, the very big vessels. So why I use not Liga Shu coagulation technique? Because I'm a little bit afraid. This is the second port I introduced. You see, the, this is the second port I introduced. For clipping device. So why I a little bit afraid to use uh, Liga Shu coagulation technique. So I use clipping, clipping device. Because vessel is very big. Two or three clip is enough. And then cut and then remove. Cut by scissors and then remove the tumor. This is after operation, you see? Total removing, only two bar hole, just five days and the baby go home without any problems. Even, even this kind of tumor is possible now operate endoscopically. You see the all hemispheres are full by the tumors. You see lateral and all hemispheres. It's really not easy case because the patient's also very small. So you really need a minimally invasive surgery in this kind of disease. For which uh, ventricle we create the port. This is the operation in the left ventricle. At first we dissect and estimate uh, vascularization in the left ventricle. You see, we see the peduncle and now start to coagulate the vessel peduncles inside of the horrid plexus. After coagulation, we coagulate and cut, coagulate and cut. Step by step. You see, coagulation and cutting, coagulation and cutting. This kind of surgery, this type of surgery must create very precisely because if you not, if you not coagulate vessels, must be a lot of bleeding. And this is very interesting. How I remove uh, this uh, tumor? You see, the big tumor I remove from very small very small uh, barco, like a fish man in the ice river. Completely total from left side, you see. And now I go to the right side. This is a right lateral ventricle. Also, same steps. Dissection the vessels, dissection the peduncle with vessels, also coagulate and cut, coagulate and cut, step by step. And same, same manipulation, you see? Like a fishman of, for the network. This is after operation, completely total removal. Just uh, one hour for these uh, two, two both sides. Very fast and uh, really bloodless, really bloodless, really minimally invasive. Just only two bar four. Now, very widely, I use laser. It's now really a revolution for me <laughs> for the, this uh, kind of uh, surgery. And it's possible to, now it's no limit. I hope in the future. <clears throat> for
For example, also uh, gamma ortoma third ventricle, big one. You see big one, not only third ventricle grows in the interpenicular, also <clears throat> after gamma nerve. I, I think, uh, and I, I use in this case a laser technology with our endoscope, what, what we uh, developed by Stolz company. Because the ventricle is very narrow, so not possible to use standard endoscope, only, only my endoscope. At first we calculate the target point because the uh, ventricle is very narrow, you see. Target point for Ryan Monroe, so uh, all, 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 all uh, parameters we put inside. And this is our operation. I introduce, I introduce, it's very narrow Monroe, you see? It's very narrow. With only our scopes is possible for this kind of surgery. No standards in the scope. So you see the third ventricle, you see the gamma toma. <coughs> And now we see shrink. This is laser ablation and coagulation of the tumor and disconnection tumor from the lateral wall of the third ventricle. At first we coagulate and then uh, receive uh, the biopsy, took the biopsy. And after we stop small, small, Small so bleeding by coagulation by the laser. You see the tip of the laser. You see the tip of the laser here. Coagulate, shrink the tumor, and vaporizate the tumor also. You see. Completely uh, all tumor vaporized now by the laser. And very easy to stop hemorrhage. Because in this kind of surgery, endoscopic surgery, the bleeding is problem, every time problem. But when you use laser, no problem now, because stop bleeding is very easy and very precisely. This is after surgery. This is after surgery. Choroid, uh, choroid cyst surgery, for example, you see also a very small choroid cyst. Also, you see the choroid plexus, choroid cyst, fornix, foramen monroe. By the laser, I uh, open the wall very precisely. I open the wall of the Colored cyst and a little bit shrinked the colored plexus for open view of the colored cyst. You see the tip of the, you see the tip and vaporized the contents of the colored cyst by the laser. You see the tip of the laser. Very precise manipulation. When I open widely colored cyst wall and suction contents just to mobilize. <clears throat> and you see the very precise coagulation. If you have bleeding, some bleeding, suction, even necessary, you also coagulate, very precisely coagulate cord plexus if obscure the VU and cut the, the, the base of the wall after coagulation. You see example of the, of the stop bleeding. I try to stop a little bit by, by Fogarty, but not satisfied, not satisfied. So why I use very precise laser. It's amazing too. After surgery, total removal. 
This is complication. Complication is not so high. It's only transient. But most important is the complications, uh, how you, you manage the complications. Main problem is the bleeding. So you must <clears throat> uh, not, uh, not afraid. So endoscopic neurosurgeons have a lot of, lot of uh, possibilities for stop bleeding. Coagulation, irrigation, compression, laser, and so on. And you see the one of the example. Also colloidal surgery. Coagulation open and start bleeding. Try to coagulate, try to find vessel. And now, and now, no, no, not trying to find. So I use the the, the uh, lens, lens, water lens, <clears throat> water lens possibility. You see, <clears throat> I pushed by sheet of the endoscope and create the water lens. And this water lens is very easy to find the vessel. And very precise stop coagulation, St uh, very precise stop bleeding. Sorry. After I continue surgery without any problem. Total removal. So this is my conclusion. but still have disadvantages in this kind of surgery. We still need a uh, lot of work in this direction. But uh, main important is the learning curve of surgeons. So why? I have a lab. In my Federal Center of Neurosurgery, I have special lab for training, not only in endoscopic, also in uh, skull-based surgeon and so on. And you see how it works. We have 11 box stain for 20 participants with uh, uh, every place is 3D possibilities for studying anatomy. We have uh, also our channel, YouTube channel for our operations. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Albert. Uh, that was really a very nice presentation. Uh, I think uh, there are a couple of things I would like to comment on. Uh, number one, which you have shown towards the end, the use of laser. I think uh, that has certainly made life much more easier for endoscopic surgery. And of I course. think you are using thulium laser. Is that correct? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, unfortunately, in India, uh, for a short while, uh, they wanted to sell something, but I think uh, they have withdrawn from uh, the country. So we at present do not have any endoscopic uh, laser available except for, uh, I think, one unit which has been sold in Hyderabad. Uh, but uh, then there are other ways of coagulation, some of which you have showed very well. What I have not seen before, I have seen only in experimental labs, is the use of... Uh, the clip applicator, which you have done through the uh, endoscope, is that something which you have developed or it is commercially yeah, available? No, 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 no. because uh, uh, um, clip applicator are using biportal approach. Uh -huh. So for biportal approach, it's possible to use standard lab pediatric laparoscopic clip applicator. So okay. when you talk about uh, biportal surgery, are you saying that one channel can be uh, either endoscopic or microscopic? Oh, it's possible. Uh, uh, two port is uh, two port is uh, for endoscopy. Okay. And you see, I, I show you my operation room now. So, so the second port, you use a second endoscope, or you oh, use only second, instrument? Second, yeah, a second instrument. What, what you need? It depends uh, from the situation. When you do a biportal surgery, yeah. do you put a proper port inside, 
or do you use another endoscope? No, no usually I use uh, some, uh, some flexible like this. Uh, okay, so it is a rigid endoscope on one side and flexible endoscope on the other side. Is that what you are saying? Yeah, it depends. It's possible, uh, it's possible to change. Uh, up to you, no problem. Oh. Instrument, so endoscope. That... Flexible. I think that is a concept which is not very popular in neurosurgery, but something worth thinking about. Uh, and uh, I think uh, especially what you have shown in children for choroid plexus papilloma, it is, it is ideal and it is probably the best way to do it. But I think uh, uh, you will probably be a pioneer in that kind of a surgery. You have already shown your excellent lab and I have had an opportunity to visit it as well. So I, I must congratulate you for developing a very good center, not only for surgeries, but also for your labs. And I think Abida has a comment to make. Uh, Abida? Yes, yes, sir. I'm here. Yes, Dr. Sufya, now that was a beautiful presentation. And I've had the pleasure to visit your center and see your surgeries and see your lab. And I must say that it is a state of the art lab and you have uh, they have 3d 3d uh, connections and which can be relayed to the auditorium there was different center for endoscopic surgeries and i think it has it is a brilliant conception of the lab that you have in your center and it is a great learning tool they do a lot of uh, white fiber work also and i think they do a lot of epilepsy surgery also and so congratulations on your center and the great work that you are doing Thank you. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, Professor Albert. It was, you know, personally my great honor that you have participated in this teaching forum for so many young and so many senior neurosurgeons. You are developing this special surgery, intraventricular surgery through endoscope. I think this is one of the kind I don't know of any other center which has focused so much on developing tools and equipment for endoscopic uh, intraventricular brain surgery. Uh, Professor Dev Pujari is the chairman of WFNS Endoscopy Committee. Uh, Dr. Dev Pujari, is there any other center in the world who is doing such great work? Well, uh, uh, Charlie Teo is doing some biportal work, but most other people are doing uh, work only with uh, a single port uh, surgery. And people have actually developed ports which could be left in and, uh, you know, then it works like a proper channel to operate with two instruments uh, uh, with uh, endoscope on the side. But uh, Albert has shown a little different technique than that. So, uh, I mean, Prevedelo uh, and uh, Schwartz, these people are already using port surgery, but it is usually monoport surgery. So the concept is very nice. And uh, I think the use of laser also has made it easier and some other instruments which he has developed. You have anything further to comment, Albert? Uh, very interesting now. We now uh, develop a very new model. I see the in my, in my slide. This is a, a simulator. Ah, this right. is a, yeah, this is a personal simulator. Uh, it's possible to create before the surgery by a DICOM slide, uh, individual model of the tumor inside of the ventricle, you see? And the possible and possible and possible training by the neurosurgical team before the uh, life surgery. It's very important. And just to estimate your, your approaches, your, your ports. Need one port, need two ports, three ports. It's very useful uh, simulator now. We just create in, in, in our center, in my team, with my team together. Very important also. Okay, Albert, thank you very much for your great presentation. And I hope you will give this message to the whole world and uh, this intraventricular surgery through endoscope will become indeed popular. Now I have my great pleasure to invite my very personal and very dear friend, Professor Bin Zhu. Professor Bin Zhu is one of the stars of, of uh, bypass surgery throughout the world. Albert, you know it. Albert, okay. you, have, uh, you know about Bin Zhu. He's one of the very young fellow and very emerging 
artist of bypass and many young Indian neurosurgeons and neurosurgeons from all over the world have learned from Binzu's technique. He has come so many times to India and all over the place I see him and personally such a, you know, he's slowly and surely and definitely becoming the star of world neurosurgery. And more than that, he's so humble and so nice. My dear Bin Zhu, I invite you to give your beautiful, I'm sure, beautiful lecture. Bin Zhu for you, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Atoko, and uh, congratulations for Sofianov. Uh, actually, I visited uh, you uh, in Tumen uh, last uh, September. Very nice uh, <clears throat> Congress. So uh, my topic is uh, bypass for Moya Moya vasculopathy. So bypass surgery uh, is like um, uh, mountain actual trial uh, running. Uh, it uh, looks dangerous, but actually it also have a lot of fun. So it needs balance, coordination, speed, concentration, agility, uh, patience and the flexibility and the perfectionism. So this is a, uh, this girl is a, uh, uh, Alicia Fagiani, uh, she is also a neurosurgeon from Italy. So how can a resident uh, hike his uh, mountain? So they need three steps, uh, model, uh, model training, just like uh, Sofianov's uh, laboratory and the live model training and the high flow uh, center exposure. The first step is a model training. Uh, who can use plastic growth uh, sutures, silicon models, or plastic balloons, chicken wings, or placenta vessels to do the uh, anastomos. Then the second step, uh, live model training. Uh, I think the best model is uh, rats. So the third step is a uh, high flow center exposure. Uh, like uh, in our hospital, I have uh, uh, more than 20 bypass procedure per week. So this is a learning curve of uh, Alicia. Uh, he already performed uh, eight STMCA bypass procedure as a resident. The uh, patency rate is uh, 100%. Uh, last month, he have uh, three bypasses. Uh, the mean occlusion time of the recipient artery is only 23 minutes. So this is a follow-up uh, DSA for, the, for his work. Very successful. And uh, I come from Hwasan Hospital. Uh, is a huge department of neurosurgical department. Last year, we totally, uh, including the uh, cyber knife or common knife, totally we have uh, around 18,000 operations, uh, including uh, on the 13,000 uh, open surgeries. Totally, we now have uh, four campus. We have uh, 800 beds. 40, uh, 40 operation rooms. We are the WFNS ACNS training center. So this is my personal experience in bypass. Uh, last year, I have uh, uh, more than 1,000 cases of bypass. Totally now, I have more than 7,000 cases. So, uh, this is uh, after the 10 cases of bypass, we still have time for a dinner. And the, uh, the next picture shows we, uh, this, this day we have uh, 15 cases totally. So for Moya Moya vasculopathy, uh, normally we use uh, uh, all the three branches of ECA which is a STA or post-auricular artery or occipital artery of scalp, 
uh, deep temporal artery of uh, temporal muscle, middle meningeal artery of the dura. So we use all the three arteries. Uh, we use a combined approach for Moya Moya to allow maximum use of the three arteries. So uh, every uh, patient was uh, uh, designed the uh, surgical plan according to their uh, conditions. So it's an individualized design. Uh, the, uh, this is a skin incision, the bone flap, dural, and the uh, bypass location is all, indiv uh, all individualized design. So the STMC bypass is an uh, end-to-side anastomose. Uh, it's also most adopted blood flow augmentation procedure. Indications including uh, Moya Moya disease, complicated aneurysms, MCA, or IC occlusion case. So for this kind of case, uh, normally they already exist uh, ischemic condition. So time is a very uh, important. The mean temporal uh, occlusion time in the course trial is uh, around uh, more than uh, 50 minutes. Uh, for, uh, for a very skillful bypass neurosurgeon, at least uh, 20 minutes. But uh, if we uh, 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 use uh, uh, my most simplified uh, technique uh, for a uh, trained beginner uh, like uh, Alicia, uh, only take 20 to 30 minutes. And my personal record is uh, five minutes and 40 seconds. So in my whole area of my personal series, uh, my mean occlusion time uh, is uh, 13.5 minutes. So the mean uh, time from skin to skin, it's around uh, 90 minutes. So I always dissect the STA or P uh, post auricular artery or occipital artery from inner side of the scalp. So this is a very fast, uh, procedure only take uh, minutes to harvest the uh, STA. This is a small uh, power uh, monopolo. After uh, dissect the STA, I close the incision of the superficial temporal fissure from inner side. Sometimes uh, even uh, double layer suturation, including carrying and the superficial temporal fissure. Sometimes if the uh, circles was uh, quite wide, uh, we can also use some dural strip to fix it. So this kind of procedure is uh, to prevent the delayed scalp healing or infection. So the uh, secret for Moya Moya uh, of the surgery is to keep the integrity of STA, deep temporal artery, or middle meningeal artery, to keep the, all the three networks uh, intact. For this kind of patient, they are very sensitive uh, for the uh, breathing loss. So uh, for the whole uh, cryotomy, uh, the bleeding loss was uh, uh, controlled less than 20 uh, milliliter. For the uh, late, uh, late stage uh, Moya Moya, normally the uh, middle meningeal artery is already have some spontaneous stoma with the cortex. So uh, this kind of uh, middle meningeal artery have to be uh, protected very well. So the best protection of middle meningeal artery is keeping the integrity of middle meningeal artery, MMV, and the covered bone complex like this. So I do the uh, double window technique like this. So uh, MMV is always a company of the MMA. You can see it's uh, like a, a sinus. So it's uh, impossible to uh, get the hemostosis uh, with the uh, bipolar. So my uh, solution is uh, like this, to use a strip of gel form 
to compress uh, M and V, but uh, at the same time to keep, keep the integrity of M and A. So this can get the perfect uh, hemostosis. So I call this is a uh, Chinese spring roll. So this is a, a, a anastomos of the STA to MCA. This is a 10 0 uh, protein suture. You can see only less than uh, six minutes uh, finished the stoma. So this is uh, after the uh, first uh, uh, successful bypass, the second one can be used for uh, hands-on training for the assistant. So normally the first uh, 10 bypasses uh, performed by assistant were all trained in this way. So this is a ICG. You can see all the uh, bypass was patent. The stoma is located in ischemic area. So this is a, a learning curve uh, of uh, my assistant, Dr. Anqing Zhu. And this is uh, the case number, uh, the, patient uh, the patent rate, and the complication rate, and the mean occlusion time. You can see uh, now he already have around uh, 300 case, cases. Now the uh, complication rate is uh, keep very low. It's around 3.8%. Uh, and the mean occlusion time uh, from 40 minutes decreased to 21 minutes. Uh, another uh, Dr. Gao Chao and uh, almost the same learning curve. Now he have around 500 cases. Now you can see the patent rate is uh, very high, uh, almost 97%. Uh, uh, and the uh, complication rate is only 2.6%. Uh, Mean occlusion time is also, uh, is also 21 minutes. Uh, another one, uh, Dr. Uh, Yu Jing Liao, and almost uh, the same story. Uh, you can see uh, his mean occlusion time now is uh, 20, uh, 24 minutes, and the uh, complication rate is also very low, 2.6%. Now the patent rate is 100%. Uh, so this is uh, another uh, assistant, uh, Dr. Uh, Xu Feng. Uh, <clears throat> he uh, go to another city for support of the local uh, neurosurgical department. So last year he had no cases, but uh, this year uh, he recovered the bypass case. So now he, uh, his uh, mean occlusion time is also 22 minutes. So this is a very simple technique uh, in anastomose. Uh, I only use two or three curved microtemporal clips. Don't need to sacrifice any branch of the recipient artery. And I never use a rubber mat or silicon rubber tube. Uh, interrupted uh, uh, suturing, square knot is enough. And uh, this is a, a square knot, also called a, a cellulose knot. You can see the uh, suture tear, uh, the first uh, knot and the second knot should point to reverse the direction. So this knot couldn't be lo loosened. It's very tight. But if the uh, suture tear point to the same direction, you can see what would happen. This is a Slide knot. So uh, actually, uh, uh, to a successful uh, bypass, we should know dynamic changes. So uh, we should know the uh, the common fluid uh, mechanical principles. The first one is uh, Poisson's law. This is uh, about the uh, blood volume. 
data P, uh, according to this Poisson's law, the data P is the only motive power for driving the blood flow. So we should make sure to keep data P positive. The stoma near the high pressure location uh, is uh, dangerous for delayed occlusion of the bypass. So we should uh, select the right position of the recipient artery. So I pu uh, published uh, this uh, two uh, pressure gradient of MCA network uh, in the book, uh, in this book. Uh, it's already pu published this uh, January. Uh, it's uh, edited by Peter Jacozzi. So this is the first pressure gradient of MCA. It still keeps the physical, uh, physiological direction. Uh, it's uh, still, uh, the blood flow still come from proximal to uh, distal. So the uh, pressure of the proximal is larger than uh, P distal. But sometimes uh, the pressure gradient of MCA was reversed like this one. We can see the uh, latest uh, should uh, M2. Uh, the blood flow comes from PCA to MCA. So this is a reverse physiological direction. P proximal is less than P distal. So after a successful uh, bypass, we always can uh, find the red T sign uh, in the uh, flow 800. Uh, pictures. We, uh, this means uh, the bi-direction fast blood flow means a big difference of, of data P. So this kind of bypass is sustainable. But uh, if you choose the uh, uh, wrong recipient artery, you can see this is a, a very short arm of the red T. In this picture, you can see this uh, very short arm of the red T which means uh, the data P is very positive. So what happened after one week, we can see the CTA shows the bypass was almost occluded. So uh, that's why I recommended this uh, parallel bypass, which means uh, uh, the donor arteries blood flow, the main uh, blood flow, the direction should keep uh, with the uh, uh, same direction of the uh, pressure gradient of the MCA. So according to our uh, uh, research, the uh, parallel bypass is better than the uh, anti-parallel ones. So the second uh, uh, important common fluid mechanical principle is the Bernoulli's uh, principle, which is about the energy loss Actually, for Moya Moya, uh, for Moya Moya disease or Moya Moya uh, syndromes, this is a, uh, the throttle, uh, the throttle uh, principle is uh, uh, very similar to the uh, Moya Moya vessels. So we can see the uh, flow velocity uh, is the largest at the uh, constricted section, which means in the in this small uh, Moya Moya vessels, the uh, flow uh, ve uh, velocity is very high, but the uh, flow, the, the pressure is uh, quite low. Uh, then after this Moya vessels, is the blood flow come to M2. Actually the M2, uh, the ve uh, ve velocity was decreased, the pressure was uh, increased again, but the downstream uh, pressure doesn't fully recover to the upstream because of the uh, energy loss, uh, a lot of energy loss in the Moya Moya basis. So actually we also can calculate the uh, different shape of the stoma. Uh, some uh, neurosurgeons recommended this kind of uh, fish mouth stoma. So we can calculate the, the uh, zeta of this stoma. According to the Freud uh, mechanical formula, uh, we can calculate the resistant coefficient uh, zeta of the fish mouse stoma. So this is a formula. And the greater the ratio of A3, which, uh, which means uh, uh, 
the largest uh, area comparing to the donor arteries uh, uh, section area, A3 to A1, the greater the resistant coevidence is. The resistant coevidence zeta is uh, uh, proportional to the square of A3 comparing to A1. So uh, Professor Yokokato already showed the, uh, the hemodynamic change and the uh, energy loss in the uh, aneurysms. So we can see actually, uh, according to the, uh, this uh, hemodynamic change, we can see the bigger imperial part of ICA can cause additional local energy loss. So this is uh, the blue, blue line means the additional uh, energy loss. So my recommended is a uh, uh, stoma should keep the oval shape as natural uh, branch. So this is uh, uh, my stoma shape is uh, always keep the oval shape. You can see the natural branch of the uh, vessels is always uh, the oval shape, but not the uh, fish mouth. We can also calculate the uh, zeta of the, uh, this kind of oval shape. So this is a relationship among diameter, uh, perimeter, and the cross-section area of ovoid anastomosis. So this is uh, uh, also the formula uh, to calculating uh, the resistant coevident zeta of the ovoid anastomosis. So under the same condition of the donor and the recipient artery, the ratio of the A3 to A1 is uh, closer to one. So the local resistance, uh, the zeta is a smaller compared to fish mouse. And the local energy uh, consumption is lower. So there's no low, uh, lower risk to form the uh, uh, aneurysm around the uh, stoma. So we can also use loop technique. This can even uh, have even less movement of hands. This is my uh, Chinese colleague, Dr. Cai Li who draw these pictures. And sometimes, uh, especially at the donor artery of uh, STA, we can see some sharp bands uh, are quite normal, uh, are, quite, are quite common in uh, STA. So suppose STA is uh, taken from if connection tissue is cut in the sharp bands to make it more straight uh, on the one hand, local energy loss, HJ, of the band can be reduced. On the other hand, the flow can be straightened and the HF reduced. So we can see, uh, we can uh, cut the sharp band and make it straight. So the energy loss will, can be get smaller. Actually for Moyamoya uh, disease, normally the recipient artery was uh, quite small. So uh, there's a bottleneck of the blood flow. How to, how to be uh, less wasteful? This is uh, the first condition. If the uh, donor artery uh, to the recipient, the ratio is a, uh, greater than uh, about 1.2. So the draining capacity of the recipient vessel is less than the maximum uh, cut flow. So uh, Q uh, actually ha have some uh, part uh, to, to be waste. So this kind of uh, condition, we can uh, put the stoma near the uh, bifurcation of the recipient artery. According to the calculating, the Q4 is an increase, uh, increased part, which is uh, equivalent to open another uh, hole in, uh, in the, uh, as in the restrictor and the 
this can uh, this will reduce the energy waste of the donor vessel. So we can see the if the uh, stoma located uh, near the uh, bifurcation, the recipient artery can drain uh, more blood flow into the cerebral. This is the second condition, uh, the bottle uh, neck of blood flow. So sometimes the recipient artery was quite good, uh, but the uh, donor artery was quite small, uh, but uh, it's quite long. We can uh, use a double barrel bypass uh, with uh, one single branch of STA, uh, cut one segment to do another additional uh, uh, end to side uh, stoma around uh, here. Then we can create double bypass. So this kind of, uh, uh, this is a second way to uh, create, uh, to increase the blood flow into the cerebral. So this is a targeted bypass, single bypass, double bypass, sometimes uh, even triple bypass. So after the uh, surgery, we can see this is uh, uh, after seven years, the whole hemisphere was feeded by the STA. You can see the whole, whole hemisphere, even uh, some part of the con uh, contral retro uh, frontal lobe was feeded by the, this uh, STA. So this is a, a, a young boy. You can see the whole hemisphere was feeded by bilateral ECA branches. The ICA was to totally occluded. So this is another, we can see, we can uh, use different color to mark the ECA and the uh, ICA territory. So this is a blood volume changing arteries, the bypass uh, and the middle meninge artery, deep temporal artery was all increased. Uh, the ICA uh, blood flow was uh, decreased uh, around the, uh, 45 percent, uh, and uh, the basal trunk, the blood flow also decreased about 20 percent. A bypass technique is not a dying art. Uh, ischemic uh, brain can be revascularized. The simplest bypass technique is easy to learn by resident. This is my conclusion. So thank you very much. It was a really beautiful talk. It was really amazing to see how you do these bypasses. So my, I have a few questions like, when you do this double or triple bypass, is, is there any chance of hyperperfusion injury? Because you are suddenly reperfusing a large hemisphere. And my second yes, question. Uh, prof uh, very nice uh, question, Professor uh, Gosh. Actually, this is uh, uh, several years ago. Uh, I always perform double bypass, but uh, it's also have a higher uh, hyperperfusion rate. So now I only use a uh, single uh, bypass in, uh, in the normal uh, practical. But uh, actually uh, for the uh, Moya Moya syndrome, uh, if it's a uh, occlu uh, occlusive uh, condition, uh, occlusion of MCA or ICA, I still use uh, uh, double bypass, even triple bypass. So this kind of uh, patient, the network of the MCA uh, is quite uh, uh, healthy, so it can bear a uh, much higher blood volume. Then okay. one more. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, do you do you skeletonize the superficial temporal artery completely, or you just do it at the tip to take the advantage of uh, both a combined, uh, even direct and indirect, where you can do a pile synangiosis? by keeping the, the rest of the, you know, superficial temporal, by keeping the uh, sheath along it, because uh, that might uh, suffice for your, you know, for your, uh, by giving both direct and indirect to- uh, Yes, you know, sort of for, the typical, for the typical uh, Moya Moya disease, I always uh, use a combined approach 
for the uh, occlusive one uh, patients, like uh, uh, it's not a typical, uh, it's a, uh, for Moya Moya syndromes, uh, normally I can use uh, uh, single bypass, only direct bypass. What is your cutoff limit, the age wise, when do you do a direct, when do you do the indirect one? Is the age is a factor? Like yes, yes. All the ages. Yes. Uh, if uh, the patient, uh, like uh, uh, younger, uh, my uh, youngest uh, uh, direct uh, bypass patient is uh, four years old. Uh, if it's uh, younger than uh, seven years old, actually, uh, it's almost the same to do the uh, uh, indirect comparing to the combined approach. According to our follow-up, the effect is uh, almost the same. So now we only do the indirect for the young baby. Thank you, Dr. B. Dr. Devapichai. Okay. Yeah, welcome. Uh, I think Doctor, uh, yeah. it's a wonderful disposition of your craft and uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, Thank you. I think uh, uh, the idea of saving even the bone along with the middle meningeal artery and vein, I think is, is probably very good because uh, it's very difficult otherwise to make sure that you can uh, save it completely. So, uh, you, you have been using this technique uh, uh, for quite some time and you, you, you still find it uh, uh, quite uh, satisfactory to get a good exposure and to uh, do a bypass. So the basic thing, I think uh, uh, the difference I find from most other presentations I have seen is that you take a very large flap. The reason I am yes. Very, yes. Uh, bringing this up is what is the rate of wound complications? Uh, do you have any healing issues uh, in these patients? Oh, this kind of, uh, uh, actually it's always have some, uh, uh, some healing problems. And uh, actually this uh, uh, big flap, it's uh, uh, there's less, uh, opportunity to have the healing problems because uh, normally uh, I keep the uh, front of branch mm -hmm. uh, to feed the flap. So normally there's no problems. Okay. So one yeah. branch is always preserved for the uh, skin. And yes. uh, oh, that, that's a very good point, which I missed. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, what about uh, uh, CSF collection? I mean, you, do you manage to close the dura fully in these patients or uh, how do you manage uh, that uh, problem? Actually, it's always uh, in my uh, personal experience, there's no, uh, uh, no this kind of uh, problem uh, of a CSF leak because we always uh, just I shoot uh, in the uh, point like uh, I always close the wound from inner side sometimes I use some uh, duros, uh, dural flap to fix the growth of STA and uh, uh, the the, uh, the temporal muscle was always covered the uh, cortex uh, very tightly uh, bounded to the uh, ridge of the bone flap then covered by the bone flap uh, actually, there's no uh, healing, there's no leak of S uh, CSF problem. So there may be some temporary collection, but usually there is no leak. Mm -hmm. so, okay, thank doctor, you very uh, much, and uh, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Bin. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, and also to Professor Hongo. What mm -hmm. is the incidence of moya moya? Is your you know you are doing so many cases. And I am also working in a hospital, which is a very big public hospital you have seen. But we don't get so many patients like you are getting. What is the, you know, is the incidence very high or what is the thing of Moya Moya? I, I think maybe the, it's a different uh, system in China. Uh, because, you know, we have a lot of uh, 
uh, uh, medical uh, website, like I have uh, at least two or three uh, personal websites. Mm -hmm. So the patient can uh, uh, consult me very conveniently on the website. So from all of the country. So every patient, when they diagnosed the uh, uh, Moya Moya disease, they can search the web and then they can, maybe they can find me. So uh, most of the, this kind of patient, uh, uh, they can uh, consult me uh, before the uh, uh, outpatient clinic. So this kind of patient, uh, actually the, it's also uh, very popular to uh, health check uh, for uh, MRA or CTA. So we can find a lot, a, a lot of this kind of uh, patients. Okay. Yeah. Hongo, you have to say something about the incidents because uh, Moya Moya uh, is actually uh, a Japanese disease. Well, uh, Moya Moya disease, I think uh, Japan is starting from Japan, but the Asian countries, uh, but, uh, many, but uh, I think it's quite uh, gen genetic, uh, genetically uh, quite different between uh, species. And but the uh, Prof. Sabine has so many cases; uh, it must be centralized. So, so many patients refer to you. That's uh, the reason. In Japan, we have. Uh, uh, also centralized in our uh, university, uh, about 10, 20 cases a year. Not uh, many like you, uh, for Sabine. Uh, but uh, uh, surely uh, there's a big difference between uh, the species. Yeah. I, I think uh, I, I've heard that the Russian uh, is uh, quite few. I'm not sure about Indian. Albert, uh, what do you have to say, Albert? That's rare cases. No, maybe in my, my hospital, maybe five, 10 cases per year in, in my vascular department. Not more, more and more. Can I have one question to yes. for Sabine? We have, but, but we have mm -hmm. maybe most of them, most I don't know. In Burdenka, maybe more. Most famous center. So. Yeah, Hongo, please go ahead. Ah, sorry about that. Uh, well, I'd uh, like to uh, ask about the, so uh, you, uh, for Sabine, you do only direct bypass. Uh, you don't do any indirect bypass, even uh, the donor. No, no, no. Uh, this, uh, this topic is only, uh, it's about bypass. Oh, I see. Uh, actually, sometimes, uh, uh, I have still some cases uh, only do the interact. Oh, I see. If there's no recipient artery and uh, oh, yes. the, yeah, the recipient artery is too poor, I only do the uh, interact. One. Indirect. I what is your, uh, Dr. Bin, what is your experience with indirect bypass? What is your experience? Uh, now it's around 10% uh, of the uh, patient. Uh, that you can you can't find any uh, recipient artery, uh, which means uh, it's uh, uh, smaller than 0 0.4 uh, 4, uh, millimeter uh, uh, of, about the uh, of the diameter. So this kind of uh, vessel is uh, too small and too fragile to do the uh, direct bypass. And uh, if it's too thin, actually the uh, hemorrhage rate would, in, uh, would be increased after the bypass. So this kind of uh, patient, I should quit the direct bypass. And the results of indirect are good or not good? Uh, for the uh, adult patient, uh, still uh, around uh, 60 to 70 uh, patient can get uh, the good result. Okay. For, but for the uh, pediatric patient, almost 100% can recover the very well. Actually, the, I think uh, Professor Hongo can tell us, but uh, the Japanese study has shown uh, almost 90% uh, good results in uh, indirect bypass. Yeah, I think 
yeah uh this a uh, patency rate is quite high even um, by direct uh, uh, bypass uh, even the very small uh, vessels yeah excellent okay so my dear friends on behalf of dr dev pujari on behalf of dr siddharth ghosh on behalf of dr lucky tripathi on behalf of dr aip i say very big thank you to professor hongo professor albert professor bin zu professor yoko kato had to leave because of some work so i will ask shekhar to say a quick goodbye and siddharth to say a goodbye and then we wrap it up thank you we really enjoyed uh, the last couple of hours session and i think uh, uh, the, not only the youngsters but i think uh, everybody had something to learn and it has been a wonderful experience so i thank atul for organizing this and professor hongo uh, binzu uh, uh dr albert sufiano i i thank everybody uh, for their time and uh, for their excellent teaching and i'm sure we'll take advantage of your uh, expertise uh, in future as well uh, hopefully in person <clears throat> yes thank you. thank you thank you dear atul it was really nice that you organized such a conference which uh, people like a uh, lot of speakers of international standards have come so i really thank all of you who have given this excellent talk and it was as dr dev pujari rightly said that it was a uh, learning lot of learning experience for us also and uh, i request uh, dr atul to arrange this type of talk with uh, various uh, speakers in their field who are pioneer in this field to organize which will definitely enlighten a lot of indian uh, students young neurosurgeons as well as uh, you know senior people like us thank you everybody it was really a beautiful conference so thank you very much and on behalf of the group and on behalf of intas i say goodbye to all of you bye bye Bye. Bye, bye thank you bye bye ongo bye bye. bye bye albert bye, bye. bin bye bye thank, thank you. you bye bye yeah.